In this world, everyone receives special powers from the gods, and these abilities determine people's lifestyles. The Anaim begins with a carriage being attacked by a group of goblins, and a group of warriors appears to help protect the carriage. Meanwhile, our protagonist, a hungry boy named Fate Graphite, was on his shift guarding the castle, while his stomach growled incessantly. Later, the group of warriors passes by him, discussing how they earned money and leveled up thanks to goblin hunting. Fate overhears their conversation and thinks about how he'll never be able to achieve something grand like them because he's just a useless person with an insatiable appetite due to the gluttony ability he received from the gods, which seemed to serve no purpose other than making him constantly hungry. However, Fate believes that at least he can continue working to support the Vleric family. Nearby, we see the three Vleric siblings who are holy knights responsible for the safety of the people. Due to their profession, they look down on others and mistreat them for trivial reasons. After some time with Fate barely enduring the noise from his stomach, he's relieved that his shift is finally ending when the three siblings appear and ask if Fate did a good job in their place. When Fate responds positively, Raphael throws some coins on the ground as payment for the service. However, when Fate bends down to pick up the coins, Hada decides to have some fun by stepping on his hand. He calls Fate dirty and other cruel names while beating him for no reason, as his two brothers enjoy the situation. Believing that people with abilities like Fate should be grateful because, in their opinion, they only earn money due to the pity of the Holy Knights. Fortunately, another girl named Roxy Hart, who was also part of their group, intervenes and puts an end to the abuse, stating that it's wrong for them to mistreat citizens they've sworn to protect. While the three siblings look at Roxy with disdain, she continues by saying that guarding the gate was a task meant for the Holy Knights, meaning they were passing their responsibility onto someone defenseless like Fate, even though it was their duty to ensure the city's safety. Raphael counters by saying that they also have a duty to provide employment to those in need, as if this were a valid excuse to mistreat fate. Roxy questions the reason behind this treatment, but for the Vlerics, it's merely a difference of professional opinion. Fortunately, the three siblings decide to leave fate alone, and as they depart, Roxy rushes to help him, acting in stark contrast to the Vleric family, being kind and even assisting in cleaning his wounds. Fate thanks Roxy for her help, and she responds that it was no big deal, as they are fellow gatekeepers, and it's the attitude all holy knights should have. Next, Fate hands over his shift to Roxy, and she asks him not to allow such torture to happen again and to inform her if it does. However, Fate only thanks her for her concern but says he's used to it. Then he leaves Roxy at her post and goes to buy something to eat with the little money he earned. He thinks about Roxy's words, but Fate knows that even if she wants to help, it would only get her into trouble with the Valeric family. And for that reason, he believes he can't let her get involved in the situation in any way. At this moment, the restaurant owner notices that Fate has once again been mistreated by the Vlerics and warns him that if he continues to endure this abuse and the brutal work at his job, he will end up like the other guy who worked for them. But the boy didn't have many options, so he simply thanks the owner for the food and leaves with his stomach still growling due to the gluttony ability, making him wish he had been born with something more valuable, not necessarily becoming a holy knight, but something more useful like a warrior, merchant, or even a craftsman. On his way back home, Fate spots some thieves who were invading the castle and rushes to inform Roxy, who was still guarding the gate. She immediately decides to leave her post to confront the thieves, leaving Fate in her place. He asks her to be careful, and she reassures him, saying she trusts his abilities. Some time passes with Fate listening to the sounds of Roxy's fight against the bandits, hoping everything will end well when suddenly the noise stops and one of the thieves appears wounded, running towards him. Fate freezes but remembers that if he flees, it will be Roxy who gets into trouble, so he faces his fear, determined not to let the thief escape. With his spear in front of him, Fate manages to defeat the bandit, and with this action, his gluttony ability is finally activated, boosting his stats. This surprises him, and when Roxy appears worried about him, Fate can even hear her thoughts, leaving him more confused than before. However, as soon as Roxy releases his hand, he loses the ability to read her mind. She says she needs to report what happened to her superiors, and Fate suggests she not mention his help, thinking it might cause problems for her, as it was her shift. Roxy agrees not to say anything, thinking it's to avoid trouble with the Vleric family. However, she knows that she would have failed in her duty to protect the castle if it weren't for him, and as a way to thank him, she offers him a new job to work for her family, making it clear that he shouldn't worry about the Vlerics, as he is the one who can decide his own future. This leaves him thoughtful after all, it was a significant offer to leave the job with the three troublesome siblings who treated him like garbage to work for the Hart family with Roxy, who had always been kind to him. However, Fate worries about leaving his job as someone needs to guard the castle during his shift, but Roxy reminds him that it's a duty only for the Holy Knights so he shouldn't be concerned. 
With no other reason to stay in his current job, Fate accepts Roxy's offer. Later, at his home, he analyzes the changes in his stats, noticing how they have increased. He realizes he has two new abilities, Identify and Telepathy. Understanding that when he could read Roxy's thoughts before, it was the effect of telepathy. Despite not fully understanding what was happening, Fate thinks that with these stats, he might be able to defeat some monsters. So the next day, he goes to buy a useful weapon. Unfortunately, the two silver coins he had managed to save in five years in the capital can only buy him a weapon considered trash. With no other option, he examines each sword with his Identify ability, but they all have zero durability and strength, until he notices a dirty black sword that catches his attention. He identifies it and learns that it's called Greed. For some reason, he can hear the sword's thoughts, and it tells him they have much in common, and that he won't regret keeping it. So Fate, intrigued by the talking sword, decides to buy it. Meanwhile, at the Vleric's house, Memel discusses the rumors he's heard about Roxy wanting to hire Fate to work for her family, considering it an affront to them. Raphael, on the other hand, says they go meet Fate because they can easily replace him. Memel persists, saying that Roxy questioned how they handled their duties as holy knights, but Raphael responds that it's not worth complicating things since the Hearts and the Vlerics are part of the five families supporting the king. Then he mentions he's leaving for the military district. His sister asks what he's studying there, and he answers that it's a study on how to become immortal, a response that Memel doesn't take seriously at all. Meanwhile, Fate decides to go to a secluded place to test his new talking sword when he's attacked by a goblin. He manages to activate his abilities in time to defend himself, eliminating the goblin, and further increasing his stats. However, he soon realizes that goblins always travel in groups and finds himself surrounded by them. He begins to fight them one by one, blocking their attacks and taking them down individually. After spending the entire night battling the creatures and leveling up, he finally eliminates them all, exhausted from the prolonged fight. Fate then checks his stats and is shocked to see that he has acquired more new abilities, and to his delight, his stomach has finally stopped growling. He comments that he thought it wasn't possible to gain new abilities, and the sword explains that he managed this thanks to his gluttony. The sword tells him that people typically increase their stats in battles by gaining experience and leveling up, but gluttony allows him to steal abilities and stats from his opponents. The drawback is that he can't gain experience, which explains why he's still at level 1. He asks how the sword knows all this, and it replies that they are similar. Seeing some warriors approaching, the sword warns that gluttony is one of the abilities that defy divine laws and could cause problems if someone discovers this power. Upon hearing this, Fake decides to work alone, only with his talking sword, which reminds him that he needs money and suggests collecting goblin ears as trophies. After some work to collect the ears of the 38 goblins he defeated, Fate manages to obtain three silver coins and 80 bronze coins, celebrating the fact that he finally has enough money to buy some meat. However, the sword soon begins to demand maintenance, insisting that it should be treated like a jewel, which explains its name, Greed. At that moment, Fate accidentally bumps into a troublesome guy coming out of an alley with a little girl. When he touches her, Fate can hear the girl pleading for help. Clearly something is wrong, but when he uses Identify on the man, he realizes that the man can conceal his abilities, making them invisible. Despite not knowing what the man is capable of, Fate follows him to a hidden place where he has imprisoned and is torturing the girl without showing any mercy. The sword tries to convince Fate to back off, but Fate can't stand to see someone suffering and not do anything to help. He is determined to rescue the little girl. Nearby, in an orphanage, a nun tells the children that the goddess Laplace created the world, and when she departed, she bestowed a blessing upon each person, special powers they call abilities. She asks the children to thank Laplace for her blessings before their meal, and they all do so, except for one little boy. The nun asks if he's feeling unwell, and the boy says that Laplace isn't fair since she gave incredible abilities to some people, like the holy knights and warriors, while others like him receive weak abilities, explaining that's why he was abandoned. The nun then tells them that a long time ago, when Laplace still protected the world, before she gave abilities to people, there were no statuses or even monsters, with everyone living equally. The boy cries, saying he wished he had been born in that time, and at that moment, another nun appears, saying she couldn't find Sahara, a girl from the orphanage who had gone missing. She explains that she couldn't find her in the vicinity, so she'll search in the city. The lady looks at Sahara's empty chair, growing worried about what might have happened, unaware that the poor girl had been kidnapped by a man who was currently mistreating her. He intended to hand Sahara over to a knight, and she cried in fear of what would happen. Fortunately, fate was there and seized a brief moment when the man left the girl alone to take action. However, as Fate was about to release Sahara from her chains, the man returned. He found Fate's attempt to play the hero quite foolish. Fate then prepared to fight, positioning himself in front of the girl to protect her. 
But since he didn't know what to do, his sword, Greed, suggested that the man clearly thought he was stronger than fate, so he should play along to take advantage of that confidence. He decided to follow his sword's advice and ran away pretending to be afraid. This amused the man, thinking that if he killed fate in front of the girl, she would become completely obedient to him. Then after a while, fate stopped running and knocked down some crates in the area, leaping over them to attack the man. Realizing that fate was indeed going to fight to protect the girl, the man activated his weapon, making it glow and Greed recognized it as a sharp blade. Greed instructed fate to attack quickly and strike the man through his sword. The boy immediately did so, shattering the sharp blade and striking the man with a single blow. With the man defeated, fate asked who the holy knight was who had ordered him to kidnap the child. However, as the man refused to speak, fate forced him by placing his sword on the man's wound. This immediately made the man confess that he was hired by Hado of Leric. After being rescued, Sahara began to feel hungry, and fate heard her stomach growling. So the two of them finally introduced themselves, and fate took her to eat something. He bought two meat skewers for them, and Sahara explained that it was the first time she had ever eaten meat in her life. Fate decided to give her the other skewer as well. At night, he returned the girl to the orphanage, where she immediately ran into the arms of the nun who was overjoyed to see that she was safe. Both of them thanked fate, leaving him surprised since no one had ever thanked him before. He explained to Sahara that he had a weak ability like her and said that no matter the difficulties, if she could find humor in things, happiness would come one day. Sahara asked if this applied to her as well and he said yes. Fate remembered that his father had told him that phrase when he was a child and he had the same reaction as Sahara. But despite not understanding it at the time, thanks to that phrase he had reached where he was and he wished the same for Sahara. Then he said goodbye to the girl and continued on his way. Later, Fate checked his status and realized that he had acquired the one-handed sword technique, the same ability as the kidnapper. Greed explained to Fate that with this ability, he could learn secret arts and techniques as well as strike twice as fast. Fate then realized that the man could have used this technique when they were fighting, and it wouldn't have ended well for him. He questioned why Greed didn't warn him of the danger. The sword replied that it would have been terrible to interrupt his heroic moment, and Fate said that if he had known the risks, he wouldn't have done anything. Then Greed said that battles depended a lot on luck and victory wasn't guaranteed to the stronger opponent. However, this made Fate wish for even more power so that he wouldn't have to rely on luck. At that moment, Greed reminded Fate that the next day would be his first day of work at the Hart family's house, and he was still wearing the same rags as before, reminding the boy that he needed to buy some new clothes. Meanwhile, at the tavern Fate used to frequent, the innkeeper talked to a customer. He mentioned that he had heard that Mason, Roxy's father, was defeated by a divine dragon in Gallia and that she would now take his place. But since her father had been the one keeping the knights in check, everyone was afraid because they doubted if Roxy could control the troublemaking knights like the Valeric brothers. The next day, Fate went to his first day of work wearing more appropriate clothes. He was impressed by the size of the place when he met Roxy, who was already waiting for his arrival. Later, Roxy introduced Fate to her father, taking him to his grave. She explained that he had passed away five days ago while fighting a divine dragon in Gallia, a continent dominated by monsters. She said that being a holy knight was a dangerous task as one of their duties was to contain monsters like a divine dragon that hadn't left its lair for over a thousand years, which led to her father and his entire army being annihilated. This took fate by surprise as he didn't know what Roxy was going through and even though she was in mourning, she still cared about him. She told fate that she, the new leader of the Hart family, was counting on him. They shook hands, but Fate remembered that shaking hands allowed him to read her thoughts, so he used the arrival of a houseworker to avoid the handshake. Roxy introduced Fate to the worker named Haru, the Hart family's housekeeper, and asked him to behave appropriately as a good servant of the Hearts. Fate agreed to her request. Later, he enjoyed a hearty meal for the first time in five years, which left him quite excited, but Haru was irritated by his behavior. A week later, Fate was trimming the garden grass when two men appeared, asking him not to overexert himself and to take a break. They mentioned that initially they found him strange, talking to his sword and eating meat as if the world were ending. Fate explained that it was because he had gone a long time without eating any meat. His stomach growled at that moment and the two men were puzzled because Fate had just had a meal. Haru then arrived and told Fate that Roxy was calling for him. Fate went to see her, not understanding why his hunger wouldn't go away even though he had eaten well. He met Roxy in the garden and she asked if he had gotten used to the work. But he didn't respond because his head was still focused on his rumbling stomach. Roxy called him Faye, an affectionate nickname, and when Fate finally realized she was calling him, he remembered his late father who used to call him that. Fate explained to Roxy that his father had died on a monster hunt and she realized that they both had lost their parents having that in common. Fate then asked the reason for the nickname and Roxy said that now that he worked for her family, he was practically a part of it. 
This made Fate feel embarrassed, but suddenly, he started feeling weak and passed out. When he woke up, Fate found a note from Roxy saying that he was free from duties the next day to rest and recover. He asked Greed if she knew why he was getting hungrier, especially since he used to endure his hunger much better in the past. Greed found it odd that he was asking this only now and explained that once the gluttony tasted the souls, the hunger only worsened. The more he devoured, the stronger he would become, but that also meant he would want to eat more, and he was destined to consume souls as long as he lived. Essentially, he had to feed gluttony, or he would lose control and attack anyone in his path. Fate was horrified, feeling like he was becoming a monster. Greed mourned that when his hunger was nearing its limit, it would show in his eyes. Fate looked in the mirror and saw that his eyes were red, a clear sign that he was nearing his limit. Knowing this, Fate set out to hunt monsters. Greed explained that the red eyes were a temporary power that improved the use of the gluttony ability, granting him night vision and the ability to track prey by scent. It also induced fear and weaker prey, which was why a group of goblins he found remained frozen in place, making his hunt easier. He attacked them one by one, but after defeating them, he still had red eyes. So Fate went to the Hobgoblin Forest to continue his hunt, growing increasingly hungry. After a while, he finally satisfied his insatiable hunger, and Greed recommended that Fate hunt monsters more often to avoid reaching his limit. Suddenly, a large creature appeared, and Fate discovered it was the Goblin King. He analyzed the creature's status, finding little difference between them except for the regeneration ability that allowed the Goblin to heal. Greed explained that with it, Fate could continue fighting even when injured, which made the boy desire to acquire the ability. He approached the Goblin silently for a surprise attack, but the creature survived, forcing Fate to confront it again. After another attack, Fate finally defeated the Goblin King and gained the regeneration ability, improving his status. However, after all this hard work to improve himself, Greed suggested that he offer his status to her as an offering so she could reach her first level and change form, gaining new functions. Fate became interested in enhancing his weapon, but Greed explained that to achieve that, he would need to give up everything he had gained since they met. Emphasizing her name, Greed, wasn't a coincidence. So Fate had to choose between becoming stronger on his own or sharing his strength with his sword to journey together. As Greed was his only partner, he decided to stay with her, giving up his status. Immediately, Fate felt his power fading and Greed transformed into a magical bow. To demonstrate how it worked, Greed revealed a goblin that had been watching them and asked Fate to shoot it. She explained that the arrows would appear on their own and always hit the target, regardless of where he aimed. Fate took the arrows and shot the creature, impressed with his new weapon. Then he collected the Goblin King's ears and gave them to the orphanage, knowing that the money they would receive would feed the children for a long time. A few days later, Fate was working at the Hart family's house as usual, when he spotted a girl leaving. When he called out to her, he discovered it was Roxy. He apologized, explaining he didn't recognize her as she looked quite different. Since Fate had been seen, Roxy confessed that she was going incognito into the city for a secret inspection. She asked Fate to keep it a secret, especially from Haru, as she wouldn't want the head of the Hart family to see her that way. Fate understood and promised not to say anything, apologizing for delaying her. Then he started to return to his work, but Roxy stopped him, asking him to accompany her on her secret inspection as her escort. And so the two of them went to the city together. On the way, Fate accidentally called Roxy by her name, but both his sword, Greed, and Roxy warned him that if he called her by name, everyone would discover her identity. The girl then thought for a moment and asked Fate to call her Rocky. Greed commented that not much had changed and Fate told it to shut up, but Roxy thought he was speaking to her and got upset. Fate explained that it wasn't directed at her. Roxy mentioned that she was excited to be out with him, making them both blush with embarrassment. Greed made a comment about the moment, leaving Fate irritated. He grabbed his sword in anger, but Roxy asked him not to treat his weapon that way, which of course made Greed happy that at least the Holy Knight knew how to handle a sword. Then Roxy realized she had never noticed Fate's sword before. He was afraid because someone with such a useless ability as his wouldn't have a sword. Roxy couldn't find out anything, especially the true function of his gluttony ability, to devour souls endlessly until the end of his life. Distracted by his thoughts, Fate accidentally dropped Greed, and Roxy picked it up and took a look. After seeing the sword that Fate had, she suggested that he should take better care of it and decided to take him to the Hart family's blacksmith later. So the two continued their journey with Greed still annoying Fate until they finally reached the heart of the city. They walked through the market, and Roxy noticed some grapes that looked good and decided to try them. She bought two grapes from the vendor and gave one to Fate. The grapes were from the Hart family's vineyards and after tasting them, Fate commented on how sweet they were. Roxy accidentally mentioned that the grapes came from her house. The vendor overheard her comment and to protect Roxy's secret identity, 
Greed suggested that they should invent a story about her having a relative working for the Hart family. The plan worked and Roxy thanked fate for his help. At that moment, all the people in the market became alarmed because a holy night was approaching. After Roxy's father's death, all of them, no matter how low-ranking they were, had become insufferable. The people fell silent, waiting for the holy knight to leave, but just as he was passing near fate, his stomach started growling. The holy knight heard it and went over to fate, forcing him to apologize several times, but it was clear that the holy knight only wanted to humiliate fate further. So Roxy decided to intervene to stop this situation. She questioned the man, saying that fate had already apologized, and he was surprised that an ordinary girl was speaking to a holy knight in that manner. However, when he looked at Roxy, he found her face familiar. This made everyone wonder if she was Roxy. Once again, Greed suggested a way out, telling Fate to pretend to be her boyfriend. He repeated the suggestion, and Roxy thought it was a great idea. She quickly started acting as his girlfriend, holding his arm and asking why he hadn't eaten the breakfast she made. Roxy said that if Fate didn't eat her food, she wouldn't cook for him anymore. The two of them then apologized to the Holy Knight and moved away from the crowd before any more problems arose. The plan worked because everyone thought that the girl couldn't possibly be Roxy as a Holy Knight wouldn't know how to cook. Meanwhile, the two hid with Roxy holding Fate's arm, which activated her telepathic ability, allowing Fate to hear her nervous thoughts. Quickly, Fate pulled away and began to think that being Roxy's escort was a difficult task for him. When Fate realized it, he saw that Roxy was already far away, looking at some jewelry in the market. She noticed some rocks and asked if they were also jewelry, and the merchant explained they were raw ore and it was impossible to know if they had gems until they were opened. He asked if Roxy wanted to test for luck, and Greed commented that her identification ability could easily find raw ore with precious stones. Fake decided to try, but Roxy seemed more interested in a blue gem. Fake observed that at that moment, she didn't even seem like a holy knight, more like an ordinary girl. The merchant then offered a discount, but Roxy politely declined, stating that the gem had no use for her. Roxy left the gem in its place and continued her secret inspection. At that moment, two people walked by talking about the mysterious fact of thousands of dead goblins. Fate had indeed defeated many goblins at an unusually high level, and people believed it was the work of a monster. Upon hearing the conversation, Roxy approached them and asked if they knew more about the story, but the men told her to ask the warriors. So Roxy asked Fate to take her somewhere where they could find out more about the case. Fate realized that her inspection was about this investigation and grew worried because he was the monster who had eliminated the goblins. As requested, Fate took her to the tavern he used to visit when he was still working at his old job. When the tavern owner saw Fate, he was quite surprised as many believed he was no longer alive. Fate introduced Roxy using her fake name and said she was a colleague from his new job. The tavern owner was delighted to see that his old customer was still alive and even had a girlfriend. This worried Fate as he didn't know if Roxy might be bothered by these misunderstandings. While they were having a meal, the tavern owner mentioned that a warrior had made a lot of money recently by selling goblin ears because he had found many corpses with intact ears when he went hunting. Roxy was now more convinced that it was indeed a monster, as another warrior would have taken the ears for profit. The tavern owner commented that this would negatively impact their business because any sale had to pass through goblin territory, and no one would want to risk encountering the mysterious monster on the way. This made Fate feel guilty as he and his gluttony were responsible in a way. At that moment, another tavern customer entered and was surprised to see Fate after so long. He shared that the most common rumor circulating in the city was that the monster in question was a lich, which was a significant threat, leading the Holy Knights to take action against it. Greed said that in Fate's current condition, he wouldn't stand a chance against the Holy Knights. Fate was worried about Roxy joining the hunt and seeing him in his hungry state. At that moment, several customers entered the tavern and one of them approached Roxy, asking her to join their table. Roxy immediately pushed the man, making him fly against the wall. This display of strength made everyone realize she must be a holy knight. She then revealed herself as Roxy and immediately, all the men apologized for how they treated her. They even offered money, showing that they were very afraid of the holy knights. Roxy felt sorry for her people who should be protected but were so fearful of the holy knights. She showed the same compassionate heart her father had. Afterward, Roxy enjoyed her time with the people in the tavern, and later she took fate to the blacksmith of her family for maintenance on greed, leaving the sword feeling renewed. Roxy thanked fate, saying that without his help, she wouldn't have learned anything about the monster. He then asked why she didn't know about the Holy Knight's hunt, and Roxy explained that the Vleric family was controlling the information and not sharing anything with her. At that moment, the two of them heard a familiar voice and went in its direction, finding Hedo bothering a poor child. Memel tried to cover it up by saying that they were merely protecting the lost child, 
but it was clear that they were not handling the situation well. She asked Fate to step in, and he immediately took the child away from the Valeric siblings. Roxy then questioned why nobody informed her about the hunt for the monster, and Riff Fail made up an excuse, saying he thought she was grieving her father's death. Roxy assured them that she was fine and asked to be informed in the future. The three Vleric siblings left and the child said he hated the Holy Knights, which upset Roxy. She apologized to him, but the boy didn't recognize her due to her clothes. He then explained that he got separated from his mother and Roxy and Fate promised to help him. As they searched, Fate remembered that when he lost his father five years ago, he had moved to the capital and got lost, just like the child. A Holy Knight had helped him. After a long search, it was getting late for them to continue, so Roxy offered to let the child spend the night at her house, and they couldn't resume the search the next day. However, at that moment, the child found his mother. The two were happy to have helped the child, and afterward, they realized they would likely be scolded for disappearing the whole day. Roxy told them to go back to their homes, which made Fate happy to be included in her words. As expected, the two of them were reprimanded, and that night, Fate asked Greed if there was a way for him to continue hunting without being recognized by Roxy. The sword suggested a mask that distorts perception, making him look different no matter who saw him hunting. However, the mask was located near the jewelry market, so Fate brought a raw ore as a gift to Roxy to thank her for the work she had given him, where he had food every day, a home and friends who considered him family. Roxy understood and thanked him for everything he had done for her. He explained that he would have liked to buy the blue gem she was interested in, but he didn't have enough money. Roxy thanked him for the gift and broke the ore to see if it had any gems. Obviously, it was full of precious stones as Fate had cheated by using his identification ability to choose the best raw ore for Roxy. She said she would keep the gift with great care and offered something in return, suggesting giving a sharpening stone for his sword. Fate said he didn't need anything in return, but Greed questioned his decision and told him to take care of the sword and accept the gift. Meanwhile, the Holy Knights gathered to discuss their journey to Galia. And so time passes with Fate still hunting quite a lot of goblins to level up his stats, aiming to become strong enough to face the Holy Knights if necessary. Everyone still believed that a lich named Cadaver was hunting them because of the mask that prevented others from recognizing him. The next day, Fate works with sleepiness, juggling a double life, working for the Hart family during the day and hunting goblins at night. But at that moment, Roxy appears, informing him of a new mission. As before, she asks him to accompany her. After some time, they both arrive in a new land owned by the Hart family, where the vineyard they had seen being sold in the market during Roxy's previous mission is located. It's also where Roxy's mother, Aisha Hart, resides. She greets her daughter and inquires about the boy accompanying her. Roxy explains he is a family employee she hired. Fate introduces himself somewhat awkwardly and Aisha warmly welcomes him, saying that Fate is very much welcome in their land. Suddenly, she asks him if he likes Roxy, which makes both of them quite nervous. But in reality, Aisha only wanted to know what Fate thought of her as an employer. They are relieved that the question wasn't what they initially feared. Fate responds that he likes Roxy very much and would serve her to the end of his life if given permission. His response makes Aisha happy. However, Roxy becomes so nervous that she rushes to her room, claiming to be too tired. Fate asks if he said something wrong and Aisha explains that Roxy tends to run away when something makes her uncomfortable. Aisha goes on to say that when Roxy was a child, she used to cry a lot and was very afraid of insects. It's precisely because of these things that Aisha is surprised that Roxy became a holy knight. Aisha seems genuinely concerned about her daughter, as she suddenly became the head of the family after her father's sudden death. Fate reassures Aisha, stating that Roxy is an excellent holy knight and everyone has great faith in her. She is also doing a great job as the head of the household. In her room, Roxy looks at her belongings, including a picture of her and her father, Mason. Just like her mother, he didn't think she would become a holy knight, but Roxy wished to be like him, the kind of knight who lasts with people. However, she hasn't yet achieved that goal. Later, Fate works in the vineyard, helping with grape harvesting, when one of the workers offers him some juice to refresh himself. The man explains that the Hart family has personally helped cultivate the land for generations, and everyone on the property is proud of their contributions. Fate asks if Mason also collaborated with the cultivation, and the man confirms it, expressing regret for having lost him in Galia. He mentions that Roxy used to come there every year to help with the harvest and to hunt monsters to protect the area, as it was the main season for many harvests and monsters often attacked in search of food. The man explains that they are currently dealing with kobolds coming from the valley to the north. Suddenly, Fate's stomach rumbles loudly, and the man thinks he's just getting hungry from working so much. However, Greed explains that his hunger was actually due to hunting so many goblins, and the gluttony ability was starting to crave different souls. At the end of the day, Fate finishes his work and returns to the house when he sees a girl passing by. 
As he approaches, Fate notices that she has red eyes, just like his when he gets hungry. He tries to analyze her abilities using Identify, but he can't see anything. The girl then says she arrived too early and leaves, explaining to Fate that she came to hunt the kobolds, but that he could stay with them. She also mentions that they will meet again, leaving Fate bewildered. He then asks Greed who she was, but his sword claims not to know the girl. Fate becomes suspicious that Greed is hiding something, as she usually has a comment about everything, and is unusually quiet. However, Greed says that not even she, in all her grandeur, has all the answers. At that moment, Roxy arrives with some grapes. Passing by the girl, Roxy notices that she seems to be from Gallia. 4,000 years ago, Gallia was a major military power, but a wave of monsters caused great destruction, decimating most of the population. Roxy remarks that although survivors exist, she has never seen a Gallian with such pure blood. Later, they decide it's time to head back home. On the way, Fate asks Roxy about the monster hunt and if she will be okay. Roxy explains that, aside from being a holy knight, she won't be alone, as the warriors working there will be accompanying her, so she is confident they will manage the task. The next day, the vineyard is completely destroyed by the kobolds. The warriors set out to confront the creatures, accompanied by Roxy and Fate. They assess the kobold pack when a much larger creature suddenly appears. Seeing a different monster, Fate begins to struggle with controlling his hunger, and Greed warns him that he is reaching his limit. Fate analyzes the creature and discovers it's called the Bearer of Lament. Greed explains it's a crowned beast, born from accumulated aggression over a long time. In other words, it's a very powerful and mighty creature. The workers become greatly concerned, but Roxy promises to protect their lands and lives as a holy knight. However, Greed tells Fate that the creature is too strong for Roxy to face. It's even beyond Fate's current abilities, but he can't allow the creature to continue destroying the Hart family's land or let Roxy get hurt. So that night, Fate goes to hunt the beast, which is surrounded by kobold warriors. He takes Greed in its bow form and shoots the kobolds with its magical arrows, firing several shots in quick succession, triggering the gluttony ability. The creature becomes enraged as Fate eliminates the kobolds rapidly. It tries to strike back, but it uses other creatures as shields to protect itself. Fate continues to eliminate as many creatures as possible to level up, but it still isn't enough to face the beast. Then he fires two more arrows, but the beast manages to catch them, leaving only itself and another kobold. Greed advises them to get closer so that Fate can attack with his sword. He follows this advice, but as he gets closer, the beast begins to prepare a lethal strike. Greed recognizes it as the Ruin attack, a completely lethal blow. She warns Fate to be careful, but at that moment, the other kobold manages to hit him. Immediately, Fate heals himself with the regenerative power he acquired from the Goblin King. Then the beast launches its attack, and although Fate manages to evade, he falls as if gravely wounded. But it's a ruse to make the other kobold approach carelessly. Fate attacks the creature and manages to eliminate it, leaving only the crowned beast. As he has progressed significantly, Greed tells Fate that he can now use his first-level hidden art. So Fate transfers 10% of his current stats to Greed, allowing her to evolve into a more potent weapon. The beast once again launches its deadly attack, but Fate also uses his attack, destroying the creature's strike and hitting it in return. Thus, Fate finally eliminates the crowned beast. However, only when the battle ends does he realize the damage he has caused, thinking that he may have gone too far. Suddenly, Fate feels a strange sensation and Greed explains that he's overwhelmed because he consumed a high-quality soul for the first time. She advises him to endure it, or he'll experience something much worse than hunger. The following day, the warriors go out with Roxy for the hunt. Upon arrival, they find that someone has already defeated all the kobolds with magical arrows. At home, Roxy laments the destruction of the landscape, and Fate feels somewhat guilty. Aisha asks who could have done this, and Fate becomes worried. However, Roxy remembers the Galleon girl they saw and believes she might be responsible. There were rumors that Galleon people were stronger than Holy Knights, so she thinks the girl could have done it. Roxy, however, notices how calm she becomes when Fate is around. Later, Aisha asks Fate to stay by her daughter's side and provide the support she needs. She acknowledges that Fate may lack prestige, authority, and power like the Holy Knights, but his willingness to help Roxy whenever necessary makes him valuable. Aisha herself lacked any valuable abilities like Fate, but she still supported her husband. As she is very ill and doesn't have much time left, she worries about Roxy being alone and needs someone to support her in her place. Aisha tells Fate to think about it, even if he can't respond immediately. Afterward, they leave to return home, and on the way, Fate wonders if he truly deserves to be by Roxy's side, as he has been lying to everyone and concealing the true power of his gluttony ability. Later, Fate goes hunting goblins as usual, but those creatures are no longer enough to satisfy his hunger. There are no stronger monsters nearby. 
To hide his red eye, Fate wears an eye patch and goes to the tavern he frequents. There, he contemplates that he doesn't deserve to be with Roxy. A customer arrives and informs him that Hado was joining Cadaver's hunt to avoid going with the other holy knights to Gallia. Fate finds it odd that they are already planning a new expedition to Gallia, given that Mason recently lost his life there. The next day, after all the holy knights are assigned to the Gallia expedition, Roxy talks to her father, asking him to take care of her. Fate shows up and asks her not to go as there is a high chance she might not return. However, Roxy has already decided to fulfill her duty as a holy knight. Unbeknownst to her, the expedition to Gallia was orchestrated by the Vleric brothers and the other holy knights, as the Hart family had become a significant inconvenience to them. They planned to eliminate Roxy and Gallia. However, while the holy knights were responsible for carrying out the plan, Raphael and Memel would go to Tembern, where immortality research was taking place and Hado was tasked with eliminating Cadaver. At night, Fate goes out to hunt. He realizes he can't stop the Gallia expedition or Roxy from participating in it, but he also can't allow the Holy Knights to treat people poorly and cause so much suffering. Hado and other hunters appear, intending to stop Cadaver. They prepare for a fight, with Fate on the verge of his hunger limit. Hado and his men were on a mission to hunt down the Lich and encountered Cadaver, just after he had killed some goblins. Confident, Hado's men offered to deal with the adversary and granted them permission, saying they could do as they pleased. So three of them advanced on Fate with their weapons, but using his red eye, he could see their movements as if they were standing still, as they were too slow. Using the Ruin Strike, Fate managed to defeat all three without causing serious harm. Hado looked on in amazement. The rest of his men became frightened and fled from the battle. Hado became furious for being made a fool of and decided to take care of Cadaver himself, putting an end to this monster once and for all. He brandished his sword, but he was trembling with fear. Cadaver lowered his hood and removed his mask, revealing himself as Fate. Hado questioned how such a weak and useless person could possess so much power. Fate refused to provide explanations, further infuriating Hado. Despite still trembling with fear, he boasted of his position as the firstborn of the Vleric family and declared that he would defeat Fate. Fate then asked him to show his full strength. Using his analysis ability, Fate could see the opponent's stats. Furthermore, the knight possessed the special ability of the Holy Sword Technique, a skill only possessed by holy knights. He was outraged that such a wicked man had this power and was considered a holy knight. Before the battle, Fate asked Greed if he could destroy a holy sword. His ally replied that he would never have any difficulty against such an impure artificial sword. Therefore, Fate felt more relieved and confident to act as he wished. Hado underestimated his opponent's intelligence and power and without hesitation launched his great cross attack against him. Even before the attack was complete, he celebrated his victory. However, Fate quickly dodged the attack and positioned himself behind the Holy Knight. Due to the delay in activating the Great Cross, he had no difficulty evading it. As soon as Hado noticed his opponent behind him, he retaliated with his sword, but Fate defended against the attack with greed. With the impact, head of his sword broke in half and one of the halves flew away. Fate grabbed that half while Hado realized his sacred sword had been easily shattered. Hado considered fleeing the battle, believing he had no chance. However, Fate had no intention of allowing that. He questioned how Hado could still have the courage to call himself a holy knight. Hado retreated in fear and ended up stumbling and falling to the ground. Fate called him pathetic and was determined to teach him a lesson, not forgetting the humiliation Hado had inflicted on him in the square days before. Thus, he intended to repay him in kind and discipline him as a disobedient dog, just as Hado had said he would. Fate then grabbed him by the armor and lifted him up. Hado begged him to stop, but Fate ignored him and threw him forcefully against a tree. Not satisfied, he did it again, leaving the trees around them on the ground and Hado's face bruised and bloodied. The knight begged for mercy, but Fate was indignant at his audacity, especially after all the suffering he had caused to the villagers, treating them as inferiors. Moreover, he became even more enraged because it was people like Hado who put Roxy in danger on her way to Gali. Tired of the knight's audacity, Fate threw him away and hit him with his bloody ptarmigan attack, tearing off his arms and legs with lightning speed, leaving only a lifeless body. Almost dead, Hedo asked why Fate didn't finish him off. Fate replied that before that, he had some questions to answer about Roxy. Hedo revealed that earlier, Roxy had volunteered among the Holy Knights to go to Gali. If she could save at least one citizen of the kingdom, her life would have been worthwhile, and she would go to Gali with pride. Fate was pleased, as this was something Roxy would truly do. In a last-ditch effort to stay alive, Hado promised that he would cancel Roxy's journey to Gali if Fate spared his life. However, Fate was determined to have his revenge and nothing would take that away from him. Thus, he thrust his sword into the knight's chest, 
ending his suffering. Next, the gluttony ability was activated, and fate increased his stats, as well as stealing the Holy Sword technique ability from the fallen enemy. Greed commented that now it seemed that fate had finally become a holy knight, but fate had no desire to be one. Greed laughed as he had expected this response. The sword said that it was now possible to reach its second level by transferring the stats he had just gained from the knight. Fate agreed without hesitation, as he felt disgusted at the thought of having Hedo's stats in his body. Greed received the stats and transformed into its second form, a large black scythe. The curse imbued in the blade could cut through anything, even the ephemeral. The next day, Roxy placed a necklace with a butterfly pendant and a blue stone around her neck. She was about to embark on her mission to Gali. The final preparations for the journey were ready, and all her staff were waiting for the farewell. Despite the sadness in the air, Roxy remained upbeat and tried to lift everyone's spirits, saying that the three years she would spend away would pass quickly. First, she said goodbye to Haru who wiped her tears with a handkerchief. She told Haru that she trusted her to take care of the house, and the housekeeper reminded her to perform her duties, well as the leader of the Hart family. She bid farewell to the other staff with great affection until it was fate's turn. He contemplated expressing his feelings for a moment, but realized that a monster like him could never be with someone like her. She reassured him that they would meet again, and he wished her luck on her mission. Roxy mounted her horse, and next to her carriage, left her home, and everyone behind. Before leaving, Roxy left a recommendation letter for Haru to deliver to fate, ensuring that he could secure another job, and that the Vlerics couldn't reach him. Despite Roxy's concern, he didn't accept the letter, as from that day forward, he would be living as a warrior. Since he couldn't stop Roxy's journey to Gali, he would at least provide support and make sure nothing bad happened. So he packed his bags to travel after her. He said his goodbyes to the other staff and received a bag full of coins containing all the money he had earned up to that day, along with his severance pay. He thanked them and left, hoping to return one day and reunite with everyone. Fate traveled in a wagon with other citizens. Meanwhile, atop the city, a mysterious holy knight surveys her surroundings and asserts that everything was going according to plan. Roxy addresses a crowd of knights, stepping into the role left by her father, determined to do whatever it takes to defend the royal capital, Seifert, and its people. But for that, she'll need everyone's help. The knights cheer, inspired by her speech. After her speech, Roxy encounters Miria, a young woman who is her admirer. Roxy asks if she plans to go, and Miria responds with a resounding yes, willing to go wherever Roxy leads. Then Mugen, another volunteer knight, approaches them. He introduces himself, but Muria doesn't seem to like him very much. She believes he volunteered just to witness the chaos caused by a divine dragon and test his own strength. Mugen confirms Muria's suspicion about testing his limits, but also mentions that he volunteered because of Mason. In the past, they marched together, and now he seeks revenge for him. Roxy thanks him for his bravery and inquires about Mugen's family. He explains that he's the only warrior in his family, which is predominantly made up of researchers. Miria and Mugen exchange playful banter and Roxy smiles, grateful for their support. In a laboratory, a scientist catches the attention of a woman named Rain. She comments on the corpses left by the Lich, which are preserved in tubes for analysis. She asks Rain to examine one of the bodies with an arrow wound. However, it's no ordinary arrow wound, and after some research in a book, Rain discovers it was caused by a man arrow. Rain identifies it as a skill embedded in a black sword, one of the weapons of the Seven Deadly Sins, made from a material capable of manipulating mana at a high level. The scientist presses for more information about the weapon, but Rain doesn't have any answers. She contemplates the tubes, longing to witness one of these weapons in action. In Fate's carriage, the driver informs him that they will soon reach a village called Trita. Upon arrival, they find the place as a central hub for maritime transport connecting to the royal capital. Besides having the best goods, it's also home to many fishermen. Fate recognizes the city and Ganancia agreed, asks if he's been there before, Fate confirms, mentioning his stay five years ago. While wandering, he spots a carriage and asks the driver is bound for Gallia. The man replies that they halt to travel for the day since it's getting dark and dangerous. He advises Fate to return the next day. With the money he earned from serving the Hart family, Fate decides to treat himself to some meat and enters a shop. Inside, a young man pleads with some hunters to save the village in exchange for coins. The hunters mock him, refusing to hunt monsters for such a small amount of money. One of them throws the coin purse on the ground, humiliating the young man and forcing him to beg for help. Fate witnesses this and intervenes, telling the hunters that it's enough. The hunters are offended and move toward Fate, but he effortlessly subdues them, and the bullies decide to run away. The humiliated young man thanks Fate for the good deed, but is interrupted by Fate, who recognizes him as Set. Five years ago, when he was still a child, Fate was ridiculed by Set and a group of other boys who threw stones at him. 
Fate's father was a brave warrior who protected the village from monsters. Fate was skilled in tending to wounds due to caring for his father after battles. After his father's death, no one in the village wanted to care for Fate because of his weak and useless ability. So the villagers pelted Fate with stones and expelled him, forcing him into exile. Later that day, Set kneels before Fate and begs for his help. Fate has no consideration or affection for Set, as he is the son of the village leader who exiled him. Now that Fate is a warrior, Set implores him to slay the monsters and save the village under attack. Fate despises Set but agrees to the task since he needs to satisfy his gluttony in some way. Besides, his father's memories are tied to that village and Set is incredibly grateful. At night, Set leads Fate to his father and other village men but the leader refuses to accept the weak, exiled individual. Set insists that he's seen Fate fight and that now, as a warrior, he can slay the monsters. Nevertheless, his father remains adamant, announcing that they will have to find someone else tomorrow. However, the men report hearing the monsters screaming in a nearby forest, and if they're attacked that night, the village won't survive. So the village leader decides to use Fate as a sacrifice to buy more time. Fate tries to argue, but Set asks him to ignore his father and apologizes. Later, at Set's home, he offers Fate a drink. Fate inquires about Set's wife whom he hasn't seen, but Set shakes his head and explains that she was taken by the monsters. After numerous attacks, Set lost faith and agreed with his father. Only his young daughter remained, whom Set swore to protect. Seeing this, Fate realizes he's not the same child from five years ago and smiles as he remembers his relationship with his father. Returning to the task at hand, Fate asks for more details about these monsters. They are creatures that appeared for the first time a month ago, and according to witnesses, they can fly. Set decided to seek a warrior, but Fate is concerned because being flying monsters, the challenge level would be high even for a warrior. Fate's stomach growls and Set leaves to get more food. Fate seizes the opportunity to ask Ganangsha what kind of monsters they'll be facing. Ganangsha replies that they are gargoyles, very intelligent monsters. They observe humans and wait for the right moment to attack as a group. Then Set's daughter approaches Fate and asks who he's talking to. He deflects, saying it's his business, and she gives him a gift, a little yellow candy. Fate thanks her and eats the present, then asks if she'd like to play with him. They engage in an arm wrestling game, and the young girl is delighted. Set returns with more food and apologizes for the meager amount. Fate thanks him and begins eating. Suddenly, he starts feeling dizzy and weak, ultimately fainting at the dinner table. Set is left perplexed and questions if his daughter gave Fate something different. She reveals that she gave him the candy her grandfather had given her. Set then realizes that his father truly intended to use Fate as a sacrifice rendering him unconscious with a sedative candy. He attempts to wake Fate, but then hears desperate screams from outside their house. When he looks out the window, gargoyles are attacking the village in swarms. The village is under attack by gargoyles. The scene is one of terror, houses ablaze, people fleeing for their lives. Meanwhile, Set is trying to wake up Fate, but that's out of the question, considering he was drugged with a sleeping potion. Gree is worried, pondering how they'll save the village. Set then prepares an antidote and gives it to Fate. Greed is impressed, realizing that this village truly knows its herbs. The remedy works, and Fate wakes up, though he is still disoriented and doesn't quite know where he is. Set explains they are in his house, and Fate was drugged by his father. As they talk, the village is burning, and Fate goes out to confront the gargoyles, instructing Set not to leave the house. When Fate steps outside, the place looks like a waking nightmare. The gargoyles have taken over everything. Houses engulfed in flames, bodies among the debris, and the desperate cries of the residents. One of the gargoyles attacks Fate, breathing fire, but he manages to dodge. Greed warns that they'll be in trouble if they continue shooting from above. With his identifying ability, Fate realizes the monsters are level 27 and possess the fireball ability. Greed says that this ability could be problematic, so Fate should use the Great Scythe. He transforms Greed into the Great Scythe and tries to cut one of the gargoyles' fire attacks. However, in doing so, a tree nearby catches fire. Fate questions Greed, thinking the scythe cuts absolutely everything. Greed explains that the scythe cuts magic, but has no control of the fire it causes. The gargoyles perceive the scythe's weakness and try to create a widespread fire with a combined attack. Fate then hurls his scythe, which ricochets off all the gargoyles, cutting them one by one. Afterward, his gluttony ability is activated, and he absorbs the fireball ability. Now that all the smaller gargoyles are dead, only the leader gargoyle remains. Unlike the smaller ones, this one is level 47, and in addition to the fireball ability, also has fire resistance. Greed warns that the monster will approach to hit him with a fireball, presenting the chance for Fate to attack. The gargoyle begins to concentrate its attack, and Fate seizes the opportunity, advancing and using his scythe to cut the creature in half. His gluttony ability is activated, boosting his stats and adding fire resistance. When dawn breaks, the village is utterly destroyed. 
Set says his father is dead, as are most of the villagers. Only a few survivors remain, including him. Fake decides to examine the place with his identifying ability but recognizes that the land is ruined. Its soil is no longer fertile and no plant could grow. Set sees Fate using his identifying ability and asks why he engages in something as dangerous as being a warrior when he could make a living with his ability. He says he has no choice but to fight. Set then decides to seek employment in the city for the sake of his daughter. While Set's daughter is distracted by a butterfly, he asks Fate to hit him. Fate is confused and Set explains that he wants to pay for the wrong he did to him in the past. So Fate asks him to clench his teeth and punches him square in the face. Set falls to the ground instantly, and even Greed says he went overboard. Fate apologizes but Set thanks him, saying it's alright. Fate helps him up and asks him to take good care of his daughter. Later, Fate visits his father's grave. He admits that as bad as the village was, he hates to see it disappear. However, the memories of the time he spent there with his father haven't faded. He reminisces about those moments and promises to be okay from now on. Meanwhile, Miria tells Roxy that they're almost reaching Lanchester's territory. The Meg responds that they can restock once they arrive. Mugen warns to be cautious of Lord Lanchester. Roxy asks what that means and he says she'll see when they get there. Miria gets angry with the warrior, making a face and saying he's keeping secrets. In the middle of the road, Fate hitchhikes on a carriage. The owner wakes him up as he is yawning and asks if he is indeed on guard duty. He is paying Fate three gold coins in case of danger. But Fate says not to worry because even though it may not seem like it, he can fight as well as a holy knight. Then a group of armed raiders appears in the middle of the road, ordering the travelers to give up everything valuable and run if they don't want to die. Fate gets out of the carriage and says he'll take care of them, but the carriage owner grabs him desperately and crying. He pleads for Fate to do something because he has a wife and children at home, but Fate asks him to let go as he can't fight like this. The raiders look at the man crying in fear and decide to attack them. However, an axe hits them from behind and they all scatter like leaves. Greed, seeing this, says he only knows one person who can do something like that. Then the girl Fate met before appears. She was looking for Fate and says he owes her for those kobolds. The girl needs a ride and the carriage owner invites her in since she helped with the raiders. As the girl enters, the carriage tilts backward, so she realizes and asks Sloth her axe to return to normal. When she does that, the weapon becomes lighter and the carriage returns to normal. Fate is impressed with a weapon that changes weight. During a trip, she asks Fate's name. He introduces himself and she says she already knew him by gluttony. He questions how she knows that and she says she also has his sin ability. Fate is still confused and asks if Reed didn't say anything about them before. She introduces herself as Mine of Wrath. Then, just like Fate, Mine's stomach growls from hunger and he hands her a bag with some dried meat. The girl starts eating the pieces of meat non-stop and Fate becomes desperate, asking her not to eat at all. When she hands back the bag, it's too late and there's nothing left for the night. In Lanchester, a little girl is strolling with her basket when she's attacked by two ghost monsters. Then, a pompous holy knight appears and tells the little girl not to worry because he'll deal with the monsters. He uses his sword and defeats the two creatures, but it turns out they were tiny, practically harmless. The little girl asks the name of the gallant knight and he responds to be none other than Lord Lanchester Rudolph. Then, other girls fall in love with the knight as if it were all planned. Fate and mine look at that odd spectacle and the carriage owner comments that Rudolph is preparing for the expedition to Gallia. Explaining that it would be the expedition led by Roxy, Fate realizes he surpassed her and arrived first. The man hands the promised coins to Fate, but Mine keeps them since she saved them. The man says goodbye and they wonder what to do now. Greed says they should find a place to stay. Then Mine falls asleep standing next to Fate, and he has to carry the girl on his back. Greed says she's not exactly a morning person, and Fate realizes they seem to know each other well. However, once again, Greed remains silent and reveals nothing. So two citizens greet Fate, welcoming him on behalf of Lord Rudolph. Fate becomes curious about the fact that in this city, they revere the sacred knights. However, upon closer inspection of the two men, he notices a mysterious symbol on each of their necks. Moving forward, they are halted by guards who state that only citizens can pass through. They direct them to lodgings nearby and once again, Fate notices mysterious marks on their necks, different from the ones before. Further along, he sees more distinctive marks and wonders what is happening in this city. Greed explains that it's likely a social class system. Apparently, the Lord there wasn't concerned about pretending that there wasn't a case system. In this case, people must genuinely love him. Later, Rudolph humiliates two bound and blindfolded men. The Lord claims that the ceremony they performed was not worthy of the Lanchester family. The purpose was to demonstrate their superiority over the hearts. One of the men pleads for forgiveness, but the merciless Lord kills him with his sword. 
Then Rudolph asks the second man if he was the warrior who fled during a monster hunt. Before he can answer, he too is killed without mercy. Fate places mine on a bed to rest. He asks Greed how she knows her. The sword explains that they are known entities who frequently cross paths. Like him, Sloth Mine's axe is also a weapon of the seven deadly sins. He decides to tell Fate the whole truth and explains what the abilities of the seven deadly sins are. These abilities are gluttony, wrath, greed, sloth, lust, envy, and pride. They were born to challenge the laws established by the divine. Therefore, they are called abilities and weapons of the seven deadly sins. Among them, gluttony is the strongest with the potential to overthrow the entire divine system. Fate wonders why he, a boy ridiculed for having a useless ability, was chosen. What he thought was a great power turned out to be a curse, as he must continue killing to survive. Greed explains that his mind needs to be resilient. Otherwise, gluttony will dominate him. The trick to being resilient is to maintain a state of extreme hunger. So Fate goes out to hunt and train in this state. At night, Greed advises Fate not to fully satisfy gluttony, but to appease it gradually. A salmon appears, and they decide to test it. Fate summons his bow and fires his magic arrow with fireball. The power of the attack increases, and he destroys the monster. When gluttony is activated, Greed tells Fate to control himself. Other sand monsters emerge, but he must endure and not feed gluttony. In the room, Mine wakes up with her stomach growling. She gets up and sees a reward notice for defeating the sand golem. Meanwhile, Fate battles the sand men, gradually mastering his hunger. Greed says that now is the time for him to satisfy his hunger, as he could go insane. Not far away, a group of warriors is being attacked by a giant sand golem. Then, Fate appears and shoots one of his arrows at the creature. He tells the warriors to leave the monster to him. But they warn him that defeating the creature alone is very dangerous. The sand golem attacks Fate, but he uses his magic arrow with fireball again and ends the monster's attack. Then, the creature summons a sandstorm on Fate, trapping him. Greed says that if he doesn't do something soon, he will be crushed by rocks. So he uses his scythe to cut through the magic, and then advances to finish off the monster. However, the core of the sand creature separates and goes into the sand, trying to escape. Then Fate uses the bow and asks Greed to take 10% of his stats to use the bloody ptarmigan attack. But the sword says that this time it's not enough and he will need 20%. Fate hands over the stats and adds his fireball ability. Then he unleashes his attack, hitting the core of the monster in the sand creating a massive explosion and defeating the enemy. Gluttony is activated and he gains the Sandstorm ability. The group leader thanks Fate for saving them and asks for his name. He replies that he is Cadaver and everyone is impressed by how he managed to do all that with just a sword. Greed says that he doesn't need other equipment like common knights because of his power to steal abilities from enemies and increase his stats. Fate returns to the room and finds Mine just getting out of the bath almost naked. He feels embarrassed. But the girl isn't concerned because he's just a child and says it's his fault for having dirty thoughts. She says she's going to hunt the sand golem, but Fate tells her he already defeated it. Mine gets angry because she wanted the reward, and Fate says they can split it. When he goes to get his 100 gold coins, Mine asks why he's wearing that silly mask. Fate replies that he defeated the golem as Cadaver, so he needs to receive the reward that way. Then Rudolph appears in the shop and says that now that Cadaver defeated the golem, he must serve him. However, Mine intervenes and says that wouldn't be possible because fate already belonged to her. Rudolph mocks Mine and says that a little girl like her should be at home sucking her thumb. However, the girl hits the Lord with her axe and throws him far away. Fate grabs Mine and flees from the establishment, asking for a ride from the carriage owner. And so fate and Mine continue their journey with her eating non-stop along the way. He asks if Mine is sure she doesn't have gluttony, and she explains that her wrath burns a lot of calories. Fate finds it amusing that she eats incessantly and still hasn't developed her physique. The girl gets so irritated with the comment that she grabs her weapon, breaking the cart's wheels. Fate pays for the cart repairs, and when he realizes it, Mine is already walking away without saying a word. He follows her, entering a small village. Everything there is calm, and greed deduces that the village must have someone strong to protect it from monsters. Fate then notices a castle near the village, and a little further, he encounters a man. Fate asks to speak with the village leader, explaining that he would like to stay for a few days. The man reveals himself as the village chief, Aaron Barbatos. Fate notices from his sword that he is a holy knight and deduces that he is responsible for protecting the place. Aaron says he would like to have a duel with Fate first. Fate uses Identify to see his stats, and Aaron realizes his intention. He mentions Fate's 2 million stats despite being level 1, revealing that he also has the ability to identify even though Fate doesn't know when he used it. They start dueling, but in a few minutes, Fate lets Greed fall to the ground and loses the fight. He thinks this means he won't be able to stay in the village, but Aaron says he actually wants Fate to stay so he can train him. 
Fate and Greed find this offer a bit suspicious. Aaron explains that Fate doesn't know how to hide identify and isn't using the full potential of his other abilities. He deduces that Fate is not accustomed to his strength and says his fighting style may work well against monsters, but is not as effective against humans. Realizing Fate is still thoughtful, Aaron insists saying he has nothing to lose. Greed finds the situation increasingly suspicious as there is no reason for him to want to train someone without receiving anything in return. However, Fate thinks that training with the Holy Knight is a unique opportunity and decides to accept the man's offer. They introduce themselves and then mine appears. Aaron notices that she is an effective warrior and Fate explains that he found a place for them to stay. The next day, while Mine sleeps, Aaron trains Fate for the first time. He helps the boy correct his posture and loosen up during his strikes, as Fate would be able to use his strength better in a more relaxed state. After some training, Fate starts feeling hungry and Aaron is surprised that his eyes suddenly turned red. Immediately, Fate starts fighting much better than before. His gluttony helps him move faster and Fate begins to notice the difference in his training. After spending the whole day training, they decide to continue the next day. When it's time to leave, Fate smells a monster coming from the castle. However, as soon as he enters Aaron's house, he forgets about the smell when he sees that Mine has eaten all the man's food. The girl sleeps deeply, and Fate decides to take the opportunity to scribble on her face as revenge for eating everything alone. Later, Fate sees a picture of Aaron's family and discovers through it that the man has a wife and a son of his age. Meanwhile, Mine wakes up and becomes furious at seeing her face scribble on. The next day, Aaron asks Fate to defend his blows with a tree branch without letting it break. Initially, Fate thinks it's impossible, but he decides to trust his training. He predicts the angle and trajectory of the sword and, with minimal force, slides the branch along the blade, achieving his goal. Aaron says that now he can use his full potential, and Fate thanks him for the training when Mine appears. She quickly gets back at him by scribbling on his face. Later, the three have dinner at Aaron's house and Fate comments that they plan to continue the journey the next day. He thanks Aaron for everything he has done for them and hopes Mine will do the same, but the girl is too busy eating to thank him. Fate apologizes for her behavior and Aaron reassures him, saying there's still plenty of meat and vegetables for them to eat. However, Mine says it doesn't matter to her since everything tastes the same. Greed explains to Fate that losing taste is the price she pays for having wrath. Then Fate notices Aaron staring at the castle and asks what's there. He reveals that the castle belongs to the domains of Hazen, who used to be the king there. Fifteen years ago, Aaron left the castle on a royal order. But during his absence, the place was attacked and taken over by a crowned beast and its army of skeletons, killing his family. Since then, Hazen belongs to the Genesis of Death, a Lich Lord. Suddenly, Fate's hunger intensifies and he decides to go to the castle to confront the creature and its army. Aaron goes after him and says he will join Fate because it's his chance to confront his past. Mine overhears the conversation and says she can stay to protect the village in their absence, negotiating 50 gold coins for the service. And so the two go to the castle. Their fate uses his magical arrows combined with the petrifying effect of the sandstorm to hit the guarding skeletons, and Aaron is impressed with the boy's skills. After fighting all the skeletons at the castle entrance, the two move forward. They climb to the second floor, realizing it's probably a trap. There, they are surprised to see that the castle workers are fine, as if nothing had happened. Aaron's family is also there, greeting him, welcoming him, and asking about his journey. Fate asks Greed what's happening, and she explains that it's an illusion by the Lich. Although they appear this way, all those people no longer have life. Aaron's son asks if he brought a gift from his journey. The man goes to get the present, but it's just an attempt for his son to strike him with his sword. However, Aaron is smart and agile, managing to block the attack. The son blames his father for everything that happened to everyone, as he left the castle's protection on his shoulders during his journey. Fate thinks about ending the illusion with his black scythe, but Greed explains that although the weapon could indeed end the illusion, it would also defeat all the people along with it, and the souls devoured by gluttony would live forever, confined to an endless hell. Fate understands that he couldn't give such a cruel fate to any of those people, as Aaron asks him to leave his family with him. And so he duels with his son while Fate goes after the Lich Lord. He follows the smell and locates the creature hidden amidst another illusion. Fate hits the monster with one of his arrows and the Lich Lord reveals itself. Fate uses Identify and discovers that its stats are above a million. Nevertheless, he decides to stay calm and use what he learned in his training. Fate faces the Lord while the Illusion people beg for help, attempting to distract him. However, even as an Illusion, Fate still had to be careful not to hit any of the people while fighting the monster. Fortunately, Aaron appears at the right moment. He explains that he managed to deal with the old Illusion but encounters his wife again in the new Illusion. 
She asks Aaron to reconsider, making him remember when she asked the same before he left on his journey. Even though his wife and son didn't want him to go, Aaron left anyway, promising to return soon. This makes him think that if he had returned from his journey sooner, maybe his family would still be alive. However, Aaron decides to focus on the fight to finally end his suffering. He uses his holy sword to emit a huge light that damages the Lich Lord. However, fate notices that Aaron couldn't do it alone. He sees his son's holy sword on the ground and decides to use it to help. Together, they make the swords emit a huge light in the environment, defeating the Lich Lord and destroying the illusion. After finishing, Aaron apologizes to his family for everything that happened. At that moment, the souls of both appear, saying it wasn't Aaron's fault and that, even though it took a while, he saved his family. But even with their forgiveness, Aaron says he should never have left them because they were always more important than anything else. He promises to live in a way that honors their memories, finally handing the gift he brought from his journey to his son after all these years. They say their goodbyes and a remnant of the Lich tries to attack, but fate finishes him off with an arrow, determined to prevent anything from interfering with Aaron's moment of saying goodbye to his family. After completely eliminating the Lich, fate satisfies his hunger, making his eyes return to their normal color. Aaron then asks to be alone for a moment and says he will meet fate when he is ready. After some time, the two meet at the castle gate, and Aaron mentions that he exceeded his level limit, probably because he fought alongside fate. They then prepare to face the remaining skeleton army. The two decide to compete to see who can eliminate more skeletons, and after a long time of fighting, they return to the village. The day was already dawning and Mine complains that they took longer than they said. So Aaron pays more than the agreed amount as an apology. He then mentions that when he saw Mine, he felt as if he had known her in the past, and now he remembers. Fifty years ago, some monsters appeared in the village and he saw her briefly, with exactly the same appearance. The girl responds that Aaron has a good eye, and that maybe with a millennium of training, he can reach her level. Mine then explains that she is a ghost who is not allowed to stop living. Later, Fate says goodbye to Aaron. He notices that the boy's eyes have returned to normal and fate explains that he has a special condition that makes him need to eliminate monsters regularly. In case he takes too long, his eyes turn red. Aaron understands that he carries a burden and asks fate to return to the village after finishing what he has to do because he has something important to say. Meanwhile, Rafal shows his sister that he obtained the Philosopher's Stone, capable of healing any wound or disease. She comments that maybe immortality is not just a dream, and at that moment, an employee enters the room. Raphael asks what happened in the time they were away and asks about Hado. The employee explains that his brother Hado lost his life to the corpse, and that, according to the men who went on the hunt with him, it wasn't a monster but a warrior. Raphael gets angry and wishes to discover the identity of the corpse for revenge. Fate and Mine continue their journey in the carriage, with her eating non-stop as usual. He was astonished at how much the girl had to eat to meet her caloric needs, as she devoured all the supplies Aaron had given them. Mai then suggested they share and handed a piece of meat to Fate. Later, she lay in his lap and Fate asked why. Mine explained that the ground was too hard, while he served as a reasonable bed, despite not being silent. Fate began to question, but he realized the girl was already in a deep sleep. He commented to Greed that Mine seemed like a child when she slept despite now knowing that she was much older than she appeared. Fate then asked what Mine was fighting against and Greed replied that if they continued traveling together, he would eventually understand. Meanwhile, Roxy and the other holy knights, along with Miria Mugen, approached the domains of Hassan, getting closer to their final destination, Galia. They spotted the castle, and Roxy remembered that the knight Aaron used to live there until it was taken over by the Lich Lord. However, she found it strange not to sense any monsters near the place. At that moment, Aaron appeared and greeted them. Mugen expressed his honor at meeting the master swordsman and leader of the Barbados family. Roxy began to introduce herself, but Aaron indicated that he already knew her name. He explained that he was an old friend of her parents, and they had asked him to choose their daughter's name. In other words, Aaron had chosen Roxy's name. Her parents had never mentioned this and Mugen found it incredible that a hero like Aaron had chosen Roxy's name. However, Aaron corrected, stating that he was a former hero, having retired after losing the people he wanted to protect, feeling he had no more reasons to fight. Aaron then revealed that he defeated the crown monster with the help of a warrior who had already left. Roxy asked for the warrior's name to report the defeat of the Lich Lord of Hazen to the capital. Still, Aaron explained that he couldn't reveal the warrior's identity, as it was the warrior's request. Understanding the situation, Roxy prepared to continue her journey. Before leaving, Aaron asked if she was heading to Gullia. Roxy confirmed and he explained that he guessed it because there was no other reason for such a young holy knight to go to Hazen's domains. He deduced that the Vleric siblings had sent her to Gullia, 
Understanding that the girl had been manipulated as the Hearts and the Barbados, his and Roxy's families were always a problem for other knights. Roxy stated that she would do everything to protect her people, inheriting her father's dream. This revelation shocked Aaron as he didn't know that his old friend was no longer among them. Aaron then decided to train her to prepare Roxy for the dangers of Gilia, and she was grateful for the offer. While Mugen and Miria worked together with others on the castle's ruins, Aaron trained Roxy to become a stronger knight. He mentioned seeing her father Mason's teachings and her posture and gaze during the fight. Despite being skilled, Roxy expressed her desire to become even better to protect everyone. Meanwhile, fate and mine continued their journey on foot. They reached an abandoned place and Mai mentioned that she was born there but was taken to the imperial capital, so she didn't have many memories of the place. Fate found Mai's origins strange since Gilia had collapsed 4,000 years ago. A bit further, they spotted a monster cocoon, and Fate asked Greed what kind of creature it was. The sword replied that it was a chimera, a biological weapon tested by Gulia's army in the past, where they used a receptacle for the monsters. Mai then told Fate to repay his debt to her by helping face the creature inside the receptacle. He used his identification ability to check the monster's stats, discovering that the Chimera's name was Haniel. However, the part showing the opponent's abilities was giving an error, as Greed explained that the monster's abilities had been mixed, making them unstable. Nevertheless, Mai insisted that they could not defeat the Chimera if they fought together since it was still in a larval state. Fate asked what he needed to do to defeat it, and Mine explained that as long as the Chimera had its soul, it wouldn't be defeated, even if they damaged its body. Therefore, Fate needed to use Greed to devour its soul. The battle began with Mine hitting the cocoon to make the Chimera rise. Fate was startled to see a person in the creature's chest, noticing that the girl had red eyes like him and Mine. Greed advised him to avert his gaze as staring at the Chimera would be intimidating, causing him to be too afraid to fight. Fate asked who the person was and Mine explained that she was the core of the creature and their target. He thought he couldn't harm the girl, as everyone devoured by greed suffered eternal torment, but Mine assured him that she was nothing more than a monster. Moreover, there was no other way to defeat the Chimera. Later, the creature cast a spell, creating a wave of lava. They escaped the attack and Greed noted that the Black Scythe wouldn't be able to block all the lava. Mine used her own weapon, Sloth, to make the lava return and hit the Chimera. She attacked the creature while Fate shot magic petrification arrows. Although pleased to immobilize his opponent, Fate realized too soon that the Chimera could regenerate. Greed explained that creatures like her were unsupported weapons capable of fighting endlessly. Fate wondered how they would defeat such a powerful monster when he noticed Mine's attacks becoming stronger. Greed clarified that Sloth became heavier and more powerful with use despite the risk of hindering its owner's agility in the process. The girl inside the Chimera screamed and the creature underwent a metamorphosis, gaining two pairs of wings. Mine told Fate to stay behind her, triggering his memory of Roxy asking to sing of him. Fate questioned if he could really protect Roxy and recalled his desire to be the one with power. Determined, he considered a drastic decision, deciding to use his semi-state of hunger to become stronger. Mine reminded Fate that if he went too far, he could lose control and be consumed by greed. Despite the danger, Fate was willing to take the risk. He activated the power of greed and while struggling to resist hunger and maintain control, Mine protected them from the Chimera's attack. The girl then explained to Fate that the creature used its exploding feathers as a weapon. So Fate hatches a plan. He shoots an arrow along with a sandstorm. And after petrifying his opponent, Mine activates Sloth and launches an attack, causing an explosion on the spot. However, even with his plan succeeding, the core girl was still alive. Fate then attacks with his black sight, but fails to achieve any results. Greed says he needs to see the mana flow to aim at the weakest part. Fate follows the instructions and finds the creature's weak point. He then launches his strike, severely injuring the Chimera. The creature flies away to escape, and Fate realizes his eye is bleeding, indicating he's at his limit. Mine asks Fate to get on Sloth so she can launch him into the sky before the monster can recover. And so Fate is thrown into the air, and Greed delivers some good news. He can use his level 2 secret technique, sacrificing 20% of his stats. Fate accepts the terms of his sword and obtains an even more powerful Scythe. Later, still following Greed's instructions, he aims at the girl's chest, as it is the center of the mana. However, she realizes she is about to be defeated, and starts to catch fire to take Fate down with her. Nevertheless, he doesn't hesitate to attack, determined to satisfy his gluttony, before being burned. Fate then hits the girl's chest, finally defeating the Chimera. But as he does so, he has a vision of a man in a lab coat with several children, and thinks that must be his telepathy activated when he touched the girl. In the vision, Fate sees Mine as a child hugging her. Then he consumes the girl's life, satisfying greed and eliminating his hunger. 
but he realizes that instead of feeling the usual satisfaction, he is experiencing a sadness squeezing his heart. Greed says that reaction is expected as fate can't be happy defeating one of his own. He doesn't understand what his sword meant and asks Mine if she knew the girl. Mine explains that she forgot what happened in her past, but as the girl became a chimera, there was no other option but to end her life or else more people would suffer. So Fate decides to ask a favor of Mine. He says that if he ever loses control of his gluttony and becomes dangerous, he wants her to end him because Mine is the only one capable of doing that. The girl hugs Fate and promises that when that happens, she will do what is necessary. Later, Fate prepares to continue his journey but discovers he will part ways with Mine as she has other things to do. However, the girl says she feels Fate will lose his life before they meet again because after defeating the Chimera, he gave the rest of his stats to Greed to reach its third level, allowing her to transform into a magical shield. Mine says resetting his stats to reach a new level in Gullia so quickly was foolish and Fate tries to convince the girl to stay with him until he recovers his stats, but it's in vain, and he continues his journey alone. Later, Fate arrives in Babylon, the protective city between the kingdom and Gallia. He sees walls made of adamantium alloy, holding strong for millennia against monster attacks. Then Fate starts walking south, but Greed says there's only a gate to the north in Babylon because Gallia was to the south, and there was no reason to build an entrance for monsters to invade the city. Fate notices that Greed knows a lot about the place, and she explains that it's thanks to her previous wielder, who, like Fate, also had one of the seven deadly sins abilities but ended up losing his life, a common fate for humans. Greed says that people are mortal beings and will certainly die at some point, while she, like all the weapons of the seven deadly sins, cannot be destroyed, so she knows well the burden of living eternally, always having to say goodbye to someone. After that, fate enters the city of Babylon and looks for something to eat, but is shocked by the prices. The meat there costs five times more than in the capital, because the workers have to bring things to the city. At that moment, one of the Holy Knights informs everyone that the new lord is arriving. Fate is excited to finally see Roxy again and quickly hides his identity with a mask. All the residents welcome Roxy and Fate tries to act without drawing attention. Suddenly, he hears a suspicious comment from a girl behind him. But when he turns around, he sees no one. The mysterious Holy Knight moves away from the crowd, happy that her plan is going well and determined to end Roxy. Later on, several warriors gather in the city of Babylon, including well-trained combat mercenaries, ex-Holy Knights, as well as people who don't like them, and Fate realizes that they need all the help they can get to face the monsters, making it the perfect place for him. Afterwards, the knight who announced Roxy's arrival introduces himself to her, saying his name is Northern Alistair. He mentions that it is an honor to serve the heir of one of the five great families. Northern has taken on the responsibility of Babylon's security after Mason's death, Roxy's father. He expresses regret for not being able to protect Mason despite serving by his side when he lost his life. Roxy, however, understands Northern and states that she is there to follow in her father's footsteps so they can protect the people of Gallia together. Meanwhile, Fate calculates the expenses he will have for lodging and food in Babylon, realizing it will be costly. To make matters worse, as he passes by a tool shop, Greed insists that the display sheaf was calling out to her. Fate tries to refuse, citing budget constraints, but the sword insists, reminding him that he can always earn money through monster hunting. Next, a shop owner appears to see if Fate needs anything and starts assessing his clothes. Excited to see the burn marks on his cape from damage stronger than a fireball, the shop owner declares his ability to trust Fate's judgment. Greed comments that the guy has a good eye for details and they can rely on his work. Greed insists once again that Fate buys the sheaf. Fate asked about the price, but the shop owner explains that it's just a display model and he can make a sheath that matches Fate's sword. Fate then shows Greed and the shop owner remarks that he has never seen a sword like that, getting enchanted and making Greed very happy to have her value recognized. However, after analyzing it, the shop owner states that to make a sheath that matches that weapon, he would charge around 500 gold coins. This price startles Fate and he immediately leaves the shop. After all, prices in Babylon were already high and they couldn't afford to spend that way. They needed to cover daily expenses first. Suddenly, a group of volunteer soldiers appears and asks if Fate would like to join them. However, he declines, explaining that he's not interested in joining a group. Wanting to go on a solo hunt, the guy who made the invitation deduces that Fate is an ex mite and apologizes for not deducing it earlier due to Fate's attire. Greed takes the opportunity to prove that they both need to wear better gear, and the guy acknowledges that their appearance could help. Fate decides to hunt several monsters to earn the money needed for the upgrade and so he crosses the border, reaching Gallia. Immediately, he smells a horrible odor coming from monster carcasses and, a little further, encounters moss. Greed explains that they are slightly toxic, and if fate breathes too much of it, moss would grow in his lungs. 
Fate is startled by this information, but the sword mentions that it's normal in a place like Gallia. Next, he spots a group of 50 orcs, a type of monster found everywhere in Gallia that uses simple weapons. Greed explains that orcs are smart and likely to make coordinated attacks, so he should fight as if he's facing humans. Fake then advances for the hunt, thinking it's time to use the skills he learned from Aaron. However, an arrow hits one of the orcs, and Fate realizes that the volunteer soldiers took the initiative in the hunt. But Greed says that Fate shouldn't give up, he needs to buy the fancy sheath, and there are no labels or rules for monster hunting. Then more orcs appear, and Fate realizes that Greed was right. It's no longer about stealing the battle since the volunteer soldiers wouldn't handle so many orcs alone. The creatures launch several fire arrows to attack the soldiers, and Fate prevents the attack with Greed's third-level form, a shield that completely blocks physical and magical attacks. Greed boasts as usual while Fate tries to figure out his next move. The sword then advises him to use the shield itself. Following Greed's guidance, Fate goes towards the orcs, not only blocking their attacks but also delivering fatal blows to all of them through the shield charge, which despite requiring some strength, doesn't hinder Fate at all, thanks to his current level. A little later he finishes off all the orcs and realizes that Gula's ability hasn't been working since he defeated the Chimera Haniel. He deduces that it must be the result of the control over his abilities that Aaron mentioned. Later, after cutting off all the orcs ears he defeated, Fate returns to the city to get paid for the hunting service. Everyone is impressed with the number of ears he's carrying. One of the soldiers appears and accuses Fate of stealing their orcs, ignoring that they wouldn't handle so many creatures alone. The guy tries to take the ears, acting as if he has the right to them, and Fate holds his hand, giving him a chance to back off without a fight. However, as the guy refuses to give up, Fate does what is necessary to put him in his place. But that causes all the other soldiers to be angry with Fate. They try to attack him, but he defends himself, easily dealing with all of them. Next, Fate receives 100 gold coins for the service and Roxy appears, asking if he's the one responsible for injuring all those men. The girl doesn't recognize Fate because of his mask, and after he explains the situation, she understands that he attacked only in self-defense. Miria also confirms the story with the locals. Because of this, Roxy decides not to apply any punishment to Fate, even though she thinks he acted in an exaggerated manner. She feels responsible for Babylon's lack of order, as her father was in charge of the city's security and was no longer there to perform his duty. She also turns a blind eye to the soldiers, allowing them only one night in the cell to reflect on their actions. Fate notices that before the journey, he had to look up to see Roxy and wonders if he has grown during the time they spent apart. However, with distraction, Fate ends up not realizing that Roxy was talking to him and Miria becomes irritated to see that he was ignoring the girl. She also teases him about wearing a mask in Roxy's presence and tries to take it off. However, Mugen says that a mask is part of a warrior's equipment, and since Roxy agrees, Miria lets Fate keep it. Later, the knight asks for the warrior's name, and Fate introduces himself as Condaver. The girl then asks him to stay out of trouble, and advises him to take better care of his appearance because it was a bit disturbing. Immediately, Fate rushes to arrange that, realizing that he really needed to change his attire, as he leaves, Mugen notices that he is thin and seems weak at first glance, despite having managed to defeat all the soldiers, making the three wonder what kind of warrior the corpse is. Back to fate, he thinks that Roxy must hate him, but that was better than her discovering his true identity. Therefore, he needs to continue wearing the mask that changes perception. Greed asks fate again to buy the scabbard, but they still need much more money to get the required amount to buy it. At that moment, the shop owner appears and says that he heard fate face the soldiers alone, making him realize that the fact had already become news. The guy then introduces himself as Jade Stratos, and explains that he has had his own equipment store for three months and would like Fate to take his products into battle. So Fate goes to his store, where Jade explains his proposal better. Since he still didn't have a name in the market, he was looking for a warrior to advertise his equipment. Fate accepts the proposal because he had no reason to refuse such an offer and introduces himself as Cadaver. The two then form a partnership, and Fate gets a new and much more presentable look, achieving a better result than he was expecting. However, to his surprise, Jade says that the entire set of clothing costs 80 gold coins. The guy realizes that Fate thought he wouldn't have to pay anything because of their partnership as he was advertising for the store and ends up charging only half the price. Fate accepts the amount but leaves the store reflecting that he spends as much as he earns because despite the equipment not using all the money he received from the orcs, there was still the amount he would spend on food and lodging. So Fate looks for a place to eat and finds a busy tavern. Greed deduces that it meant the food was good there, but Fate explains that he doesn't care about the taste as long as the price is low. Inside the tavern, several guys were enchanted by the beauty of a girl, and Fate also feels hypnotized by her. 
The girl is the same Meg who wanted to put an end to Roxy. She approaches Fate and greets him, calling him by name, showing that she knows his identity despite him wearing his mask. The girl is named Eris, and like Fate, also has a sin ability, hers being lust. And so Fate sits at one of the tavern's tables to talk with Eris, and she asks him to take off his mask, explaining that the perception alteration doesn't affect her. Eris then realizes that Fate was hypnotized by her and explains that he was experiencing a side effect of the lust ability, which causes an uncontrollable charm effect making everyone, regardless of gender and age, unable to stop loving her. Eris asks Fate to toast to their meeting, but he remains hypnotized, so she toasts alone. Later, the girl reveals that she has been watching Fate for a long time, from the capital, even before he activated his gluttony ability when he was still a hungry person working for the Valerix brothers. She says she thought about making contact when he manifested gluttony, but decided not to introduce herself at that moment, imagining that eventually he would find greed. Fate then deduces that she also knew about mine. Eris confirms but says she doesn't talk much with the girl from Wrath because she is from the second generation and doesn't know anyone from the first generation very well. Fate doesn't understand the meaning of that, but Eris clarifies that she doesn't get along with Mine. With that, she ends up remembering that Mine and Fate defeated the Camera Haniel and congratulates him for the service, as the two ended up saving her from a job. Fate comments that it seemed like she knew everything, but Eris says that there were things she didn't know, such as who took Haniel's cocoon to the place where they found it. Reed explains to Fate that all Chimeras come from the capital of Gilia, and Eris says that there were probably more cocoons, which would certainly create a new problem if they matured, especially due to the weakening of the Holy Knights. Afterward, she decides to tell Fate her goal and the reason she waited for that meeting with him. The girl says that besides having a sin ability, she was also a guardian of the kingdom and therefore prioritizes the kingdom's affairs above all else. She explains that her focus is to work for a better future, and even if something causes some damage, if after a millennium that thing benefits the kingdom, she approves. Fate asks where the girl is getting at, and she finally reveals that her current goal is to bring about the end of Roxy. While the two were talking, Roxy and Northern were about to go to a small monster stampede in the east of Gulia. At that moment, Fate becomes super irritated and knocks over his drink by hitting the table. Eris then decides to explain her motives better. She says that when a monster is defeated, its aggressiveness remains and all the generated aggression gradually accumulates over the years until it gives rise to a crowned beast. She explains that this phenomenon can even happen with humans. Meaning all the discrimination and misery caused by the Holy Knights was causing the population to accumulate aggression directed at them. With this, if the only knight loved by the people is lost, the wave of aggression born with her death will end up swallowing the rest of the aggression that is being accumulated, thus generating a human with a completely new kind of power and incredible ability. Eris comments on how she finds that plan wonderful, because Roxy's loss will guide the kingdom in a better direction. However, fate finds all of that absurd making it clear that he couldn't see anything good with the loss of the knight who cares most about the people. He becomes super irritated, but Eris remains calm because her plan was already underway and there is no way for someone to prevent it from happening. However, Fate doesn't care because he was determined to protect Roxy regardless of who or what he will have to face. On the next day, Roxy and the other holy knights decide to head to Gilia towards a place called Grande Ravina to rescue a group that was sent there to collect raw materials but lost contact. Meanwhile, Fate discovers that in order for Jade to make the ideal sheath for greed, a magic crystal was missing. This material is supplied by the royal army, and Jade didn't know when he would receive more in his shop. Since greed really wanted his sheath, Fate decides to go after magic crystals himself. Jade hands him a map that once belonged to a warrior and is used for material collection. Fate takes a look at the map and realizes he has to go to Grande Ravina, the same place Roxy was heading. Upon arriving in Golia, he encounters a group of monsters and easily faces them with his shield charge. Roxy is also there, but her group struggles to locate Grande Ravina because the compass isn't working correctly, and they can't navigate using the moon and stars due to the cloudy sky. Suddenly, Roxy remembers that the area they are heading has a large population of orcs, and decides to use the creature's trail to guide their way despite the danger, as there are other monsters in Golia, including the crowned beasts. Back to fate, Greed comments on how he's starting to act like a warrior always ready for battle. Later, he falls asleep and dreams of being in an empty place, seeing the Chimera Haniel. She tries to say something to fate, but he doesn't understand. Suddenly, a lake of blood appears and fate sees all the lives he killed, whose souls were swallowed by gluttony, including Hado, who pulls him into the lake. Fate wakes up startled and senses the presence of monsters nearby, realizing they are not simple orcs but crowned beasts. He goes to them, and using his mag vision, discovers they are four salamanders. 
Quickly, fate changes greed into his bow form to shoot the creatures using his petrification ability. He shoots an arrow, but realizes they are not acting normally. They are not trying to attack or flee even after being attacked. Greed comments that the salamanders seem to be controlled and fate decides to follow them. The four go to where the holy knights were camping and surround them, spewing fire everywhere. Nordren gets injured and Roxy is almost hit, but Mugen saves her just in time to prevent her from being engulfed in flames by one of the creatures. Miria tries to attack with her magic sword to protect Roxy, but her plan fails and she also gets hurt. Roxy goes to her, and a salamander approaches, leaving them with no way out. However, fate appears just in time and saves them. He uses his shield to protect himself from the flames and then eliminates some salamanders with his sword, impressing Mugen and the others with the power he wields with just a simple sharp blade. After fate eliminates all the creatures, Roxy thanks him for the help, acknowledging that without him, more soldiers would have been hurt. Mugen and Northern also express their gratitude and Miria does the same, despite making it clear that she didn't ask for any help. They then notice that all four salamanders had an emblem on their heads, which is very suspicious, especially because the crown beasts do not usually work together, and these were acting as if they were after Roxy. However, Roxy thinks it could be just a coincidence and Northern agrees as it's hard to predict what happens in Gullia, especially when the divine dragon emerges from its lair. And so everyone goes together to Grande Ravina since they were heading to the same place. Upon arriving, they bid farewell, so each goes their own way and Miria hurries everyone, reminding them they need to rescue the missing group. Roxy then extends her hand to bid farewell to fate, but he hesitates because he doesn't want to touch her to avoid activating his telepathy ability. Jealous, Miria grabs his hand to prevent fate from holding Roxy's hand, thinking she should be the one to protect the holy knight and viewing fate as a nuisance. He reads her thoughts with his telepathy and finishes, saying goodbye to the group while Greed laughs at the fact that Miria called him a nuisance in her mind. Later, Fate continues his path, reaching a place in Gullia that for some mysterious reason has pure air as if the place is being purified somehow. He continues and encounters various petrified monsters, making the place look like a cemetery of creatures. Suddenly, Fate sees an image of himself petrified and gets scared, but realizes it was just his imagination. He then begins searching for magic crystals, remembering that Jade explained they are transparent and colorless but emit a faint purple glow. However, despite his search, Fate can't find anything that matches the description. Next, he notices a girl a little further ahead and realizes it's Eris. He tries to follow her but ends up losing sight of her. At that moment, Fate encounters a Chimera and prepares to fight, but he realizes the creature isn't moving. Greed notes that it is without its core and deduces it's just a prototype buried there during some ancient battle, its body reappearing after a landslide. Fate examines the area and realizes there have been landslides in three other points probably with chimeras, but those managed to awaken and were no longer there. He wonders if Eris was behind this when suddenly an explosion comes from the direction where Roxy and the others were. Fate runs there while Greed complains that this way he won't get his sheath. Three Chimeras attack Roxy and Miria tries to protect the Holy Knight but puts herself in danger. Mugen protects her, but he gets injured and one of the Chimeras also attacks Northern. At that moment, Fate appears and immediately starts shooting magical arrows at the three creatures. He asks if everyone is okay and learns that Mugen and Northern are hurt. The Chimeras start regenerating the wounds caused by the arrows and Greed observes that their regeneration is much slower than Hamiel's. Quickly, Fate explains to everyone that these creatures are called Chimeras, and their weakness is the core, showing that there is a monster at the center of each of them, keeping them moving. And so, Fate faces the Chimeras alongside Roxy. They try to keep the two away with their flames, but he easily approaches them thanks to his fire resistance. One of the Chimeras realizes the plan that the flames didn't work and tries to protect the core with its arms, but Fate hits its legs, making the creature fall, allowing Roxy to hit the monster in its core. Fate observes the girl attacking and realizes she receives some training, deducing it's from the Knight Aaron. Now only two Chimeras remain. Miria uses her Flamberge Flame to divert the flames of one of the creatures, showing that despite her tough personality, she has talent for combat. Fate asks Miria to leave the situation to him. She thanks him and goes near Mugen, and Roxy asks her to take the injured people to a safe place. Roxy and Fate then attack the Chimeras together, using the same tactic they used to defeat the first creature. While they fight, Fate realizes he has never fought alongside Roxy and that doing so with her feels much more natural than with mine and Aaron. They manage to defeat another Chimera, leaving only one. They prepare to attack, but the creature flies into the air. The two decide to finish it when the Chimera lands, but suddenly the earth starts to slide, causing Fate and Roxy to fall. They begin to descend into a deep hole, and Fate holds Roxy in his arms. He explains that he has a strong body, despite appearances. 
Roxy understands and accepts being under his care. Some time later, Fate wakes up, realizing he was already on the ground and had fainted from the fall. Suddenly, Roxy calls his name, Fate, still being unconscious, but this makes him realize he is without his mask. Fate panics but manages to find his mask and cover his face just in time to prevent Roxy from discovering his identity. She tries to get up and realizes she's a bit hurt, but says she just needs some rest, acting like a true holy knight. As the place was very dark, Fate creates a fireball to illuminate the area and Roxy is surprised by the many things Cadaver can do. He then laments the collapse of the Earth because if not for that, they would have managed to defeat the Chimera. He explains to Roxy that those creatures are apparently artificial monsters created in Gullia a thousand years ago. Afterwards, Fate asks if Roxy managed to find the group she was looking for. She says unfortunately, they didn't arrive in time and the group had already been reduced to ashes. Roxy then asks how Fate knows about the Chimeras and he explains that a Galleon explained what they are. She asks if it was a girl with a giant axe because she saw a Galleon in her territory once and heard rumors that she sent a guy flying with her axe and was traveling with a man wearing a skull mask. Fate admits he was traveling with the girl with the axe and observes Roxy looking at him. She apologizes and explains that his demeanor resembles that of someone she knows, someone who, even though he's in the capital, she feels as if he's there with her. Roxy wonders if he is happy, and Fate says he surely is, having someone who cares about him as much as she does. Suddenly, Fate's eye turns red, sensing the hunger of gluttony. He struggles to remain in control and hides his eyes so Roxy won't see, moving away from her. Roxy is worried, but Fate runs far away before she can follow. He distances himself and starts to feel that he's getting closer and closer to the scent of the camera, when suddenly it emerges, breaking a wall of the hole. Fate transforms Greed into his side form and attacks the Chimera's core monster. But upon seeing the creature's desperate look, he sees the way Roxy looked at him when one of his eyes turned red. This makes Fate unleash his attacks on the monster, taking out the frustration he felt from Roxy's gaze. When it's over, Greed returns to its original form and he notices that the Chimera also had the same emblem as the Salamander. Now, there were no doubts that someone had really manipulated the creatures to attack Roxy and Fate remembers Eris assuring that the Holy Knight would die in Gullia. Fate thinks he will make Eris pay when Roxy appears and sees the dead Chimera. Suddenly, the earth from the whole ceiling starts to collapse and Fate protects the two with his shield. Afterwards, they realize that many magic crystals are falling. Fate wonders because that was a fossilized monster and Roxy explains that those crystals are found inside those types of monsters. He is surprised because he didn't know that information and understands why he couldn't find any magic crystals in his search. Later, the two manage to climb out of the hole and meet with the other holy knights. Roxy is happy to see that everyone is okay, and Miria hugs her. Meanwhile, in another part of Galia, there is a guy wearing a cadaver mask to hide his identity, just like Fate. A month after the adventure in the Great Ravine, Roxy challenges Fate to a duel, all thanks to the other warriors who continue to bother him, involving Fate in 56 incidents, some including property destruction. He tries to explain that every time he got into fights, he was only defending himself, but Roxy says it's impossible to ignore more acts of violence. However, knowing that Fate couldn't go without defending himself, she suggests he join the royal army. This way, even most unruly warriors wouldn't mess with him. Fake declines the offer, as he couldn't join a group due to needing his freedom because of his gluttony ability. Roxy anticipated that he would refuse the proposal but explains that it leaves her no choice but to make him reflect on his actions in his cell. Fate expresses a wish for her to spare him, but realizing it won't happen, he prepares to start the duel, with his sword still in its sheath. Roxy is surprised that Fate doesn't unsheath it for the duel and makes it clear she won't go easy. Fate explains that his sheath is special and he'll fight with it. And so they begin to duel with Fate struggling to face a holy knight like Roxy despite having the best status. He realizes she possesses the strength of someone with daily training, but with his thoughts distracted, Roxy lands a blow that starts to crack his mask. She explains that she aimed for the mask because if he didn't take the duel seriously, she would expose his identity, insisting that Fate give it his all. Due to Roxy's insistence, Fate activates the power of the sheath, surprising everyone as a warrior possesses the holy sword technique. He reminds them that he mentioned his sheath is special, explaining that it enhances the holy sword technique. Roxy asks if he was once a knight to handle his sword that way, but Fate says he's just a warrior. He phases Roxy with his sword, putting the girl at a disadvantage and Miria starts to panic, thinking she's going to lose the duel. However, it could have happened until in the midst of the fight, Fate is distracted by noticing Roxy's butterfly necklace, which has a pendant made with a blue stone he gave her as a gift. Roxy takes advantage of the opening to send his sword away. Fate admits defeat, and she asks why he lowered his guard, but Fate pretends not to understand. 
Roxy comments that she was instructed by Aaron and recognized his fighting style and fate, noting the similarity of their moves and steps with the knights. She recalls that Aaron decided to pick up his sword again after meeting a traveler heading to Gullia, possessing immense power that caused difficulties. Fate realizes Roxy was concerned about him and reminds her that even if he was the traveler Aaron mentioned, she should focus on protecting Gullia. And so they leave, and Fate thinks she is so kind that she was worried about him, even with her life at risk in that place. Suddenly, Mugen appears and interrupts his thoughts, saying he's impressed with the duel as Fate faced a holy knight, stating it's no wonder he can defeat a Chimera. Fate mentions that the creature was being controlled by someone and Mugen seems to believe the same, as they had the same emblem as the Salamanders. Fate wonders if it's Eris' is doing and Mugen comments that whoever orchestrated the situation was clever to put a monster at the core of the Chimeras, showing some understanding of the matter. He explains that his family studied Galleon technology lost for generations, and like his late father, his daughter, Rain, is talented and studious. Fate suggests that Mugen ask her to examine the Chimeras, since they are artificial monsters made with Galleon technology. However, Mugen thinks Fate suggested it to get to know Rain due to some interest and acts like a jealous father. Meanwhile, Rain studies in her laboratory and the scientist tells her about Raphael Vleric locking himself in his room to study the Philosopher's Stone he obtained in a research trip to Temburn. She checks a book and observes that the Philosopher's Stone supposedly can heal any wound and grant its owner great strength. But in return, it dominates the mind and body of the owner. The price for using the stone is mental control. Back to fate. Lying on his bed, he remembers mind warning him before they separated that he could only face the powerful Dragon of Gilead if he achieved E-Rank Mastery. Mine cautioned Fate to be careful because if he pushed too hard, the gluttony ability would dominate him, making him lose control. Fate wonders how he could achieve E-Rank Mastery when suddenly, an alarm sounds to warn everyone of a nearby monster stampede. Northern informs Roxy about the event and she decides to go with the Royal Army to Gullia, chasing the monsters. Fate checks what's happening and realizes it's the Death March but thinks that if that's all, Roxy and the others can handle it. However, as a precaution, he activates his half-hunger state, analyze the situation better, and prepare to act if necessary. Greed notices that Fate is getting much better control over Gluttony, and helps him locate a huge monster moving quickly underground, heading towards the Royal Army. Quickly, Fate decides to take action, as Roxy and the others were focused on the March of Death and would be caught completely off guard by the creature. He prepares to shoot an arrow and uses greed to amplify the shot, aiming to achieve double the range through a technique Fate can only perform when in a state of partial hunger, called Charge Shot Spiral. With this, the arrow reaches a sufficient range to sink into the ground and hit the target. Thus, the creature in Omeka Slime emerges from beneath the earth, and he notices that the monster bears the same emblem as the Chimeras and Salamanders. Next, Fate leaps toward it without thinking, realizing how he has changed, as his former self would never have jumped from such a height. Afterwards, Fate uses his identification ability to view the slime's stats, discovering it to be a crowned beast with resistance, mana, and motivation surpassing 10 million, a monster that would even put a holy knight at a disadvantage. Suddenly, the slime attacks Fate with an acid rain, but he quickly changes Greed into its shield form to protect himself. Greed explains that it is a corrosion magic that can add corrosive effects to physical attacks, a combination of this magic with acid. Fate deduces that the creature was using the corrosive effect to dissolve the ground and move freely through the earth, and Greed warns him of the danger he faces. If the rain touches him, even his bones would melt and turn to mud. Fate then shoots another arrow at the slime, giving 10% of his stats to Greed to increase the power of the blow, including a fireball to evaporate the monster. However, after his attack, the slime disappears. Fate is left puzzled, but when he looks up, he sees that the monster survived the arrow. The slime re-enters the ground and Greed explains that the creature split into pieces to survive the attack and now, a part of it was heading towards the army. Fate tries to stop it, but the monster divides into several smaller slimes and appears in his path. He uses Greed to defeat the slimes, but after defeating them, Fate is puzzled because even though they are right in front of him, it seems like the slimes are ignoring the fight, acting very differently than usual. Fate searches for the part of the slime heading for the army, as it possesses the core. He finds a rift where the monster has to pass and decides to seize this moment to destroy the core. And so, Fate jumps into the rift and gives 20% of his stats to Greed, in exchange for an even more powerful arrow to destroy the monster once and for all. However, when the moment comes, Fate manages to hit the slime's core, but the monster keeps moving even after its soul is absorbed by Greed. At that moment, Fate notices someone using a perception-altering mass and deduces it to be Eris. As he approaches, he notices the person's weapon, and Greed explains it to be one of the seven deadly sin's weapons. 
the black pistol sword of the envy ability. Fate tries to get closer, but several monsters appear in front of him, preventing him from reaching the masked person. Greed realizes that the slime was hit by a type of magic bullet that extracts latent power, the reason the creature is still alive even without the core. It managed to split the core and escape. This ability makes the monster an enemy capable of infinite replication. A terrible combination for fate. Suddenly, the slimes attack. Greed warns fate, but he accepts being caught by the creatures and manages to destroy all the core pieces, revealing that he had already learned to use corrosion magic from the Omega Slime. With this, Greed is activated, but it warns fate that if his stats continue to increase too rapidly, he may lose control. Fate thinks that before that happens, he will defeat Eris, but the masked person blocks his attack. Greed then observes that fate has already reached his limit, the maximum a human can achieve requiring him to reach the E-Domain to go beyond this limit and inhuman level. Greed also explains that his opponent has already reached this level and can repel the attacks of anyone else. Fate then tries to fight with his sword but realizes his opponent is much stronger, and also notes that it is not Eris, but a guy. The Mass One throws Fate away and shoots him. Quickly, Fate protects himself with his shield but still gets injured, realizing he has no chance against his opponent. However, he was willing to do anything to save Roxy, regardless of the cost. And so fate allows the greed ability to take him to the E-Domain and thanks his opponent because without him, he wouldn't have reached this point. After reaching the same level as the masked one, fate begins to fight much more easily, managing to dodge the opponent's shots. He releases a smoke curtain and approaches, managing to cut the guy's mask, revealing his true identity, and Roxy is surprised to see that it is Northern. He says he's not as soft as Eris and takes out a flute that, when played, attracts the divine dragon, the most feared creature in Gullia. Fate runs to the dragon to try to stop it from reaching Roxy, while his opponent tries to delay him as much as possible with shots and slimes. Roxy and the royal army were facing several monsters when suddenly everyone panics at the sight of the divine dragon. Mugen orders them to retreat, but Roxy stands firm and asks to gain strength from her father. However, the creature launches a giant attack in her direction, leaving the girl paralyzed with fear. Fortunately, Fate arrives in time and protects Roxy with his shield. The dragon continues to attack, and the power of its magic is so strong that it begins to destroy Fate's mask, even with the shield's protection. And so his mask breaks, revealing his identity, and Roxy realizes that the corpse next to her all this time was indeed Fate. After Roxy makes this discovery, she notices that his eyes were red. Fate apologizes for lying to her all that time and thanks her for everything she did for him. Next, Fate explains that he will buy her some time to escape before the Divine Dragon returns, and before Roxy can say anything, he goes to face the winged creature, leaving the girl alone. She becomes worried about Fate and tries to call out to him. But he continues forward until he meets the Dragon and Northern, who is controlling the Dragon. Fate activates a greed power that immobilizes the Dragon, allowing him to face Northern without interruptions. They start to fight, but Fate realizes that his status is lower, then Northern explains that by forcing entry into Domain E, Fate reached almost his limit in addition to expending strength to maintain the dragon's immobilization. To make matters worse, Northern says that he is not using his full capacity in the fight, highlighting Fate's disadvantage even more. Greed asks Fate not to let his opponent get away, but Northern realizes with his attacks that he can't go far and deduces that it's because he needs to stay close to the dragon to maintain his immobilization technique. Fate falls into despair when he realizes that his opponent discovered another disadvantage, leaving an opening for Northern to attack. With a blow, Fate loses his arm. Northern celebrates his victory, but before finishing the fight, he is struck in the chest and realizes that Fate had cast an illusion spell to attack without being seen. He explains to Northern that he figured he would let his guard down when he thought the fight was already won. In other words, Fate intentionally sacrificed his arm to defeat his opponent. However, after defeating Northern, Fate is transferred to the empty place in his dream and meets the Chimera girl from Hamiel again. She introduces herself as Luna, thanks him for taking her life, saying it was better that way. However, she apologizes for no longer being able to control greed. At that moment, the ground begins to crack and Fate sees all the creatures he has eliminated, understanding that Luna managed to calm his ability so it wouldn't run out of control. Unfortunately, she explains that she can no longer help because if Greed devours the Divine Dragon, he will lose control of himself. Suddenly, the ground breaks and Fate begins to fall, but a man holds him. And the boy recognizes the voice of Greed. The man says he found it strange that Fate suddenly went quiet and suspected that he went to that place. Greed then pulls Fate up and explains that they are running out of time so they need to go quickly to face the dragon. The entire place starts to crumble and Fate thanks Luna for her help, but explains that he cannot let the Divine Dragon roam freely without its master. 
Afterward, Fate returns to Gelia and asks Greed if he used to be a person, but the sword explains that it was just a temporary form. At that moment, the paralysis of the dragon ends and Fate prepares to face the giant and furious winged creature. Greed asks what his plan is since it's difficult to use a shield or bow with only one arm, but the boy responds by throwing his weapon at the dragon. Then he attacks the creature with a punch and retrieves his sword, which complains about being thrown without any warning. Afterward, Fate analyzes the dragon's stats and realizes that he has a significant advantage, but Greed advises him not to trust numbers. And so Fate begins to land several blows on the opponent, making the creature fall and try to defend itself by spitting fire. He cuts open the flames with the sword and manages to put an end to the powerful divine dragon. However, after Greed devours its soul, Fate begins to spit blood and realizes that he is on the verge of losing control. He worries because if this happens at that moment, he will become an even greater threat than the dragon. So Fate transfers his stats to Greed, causing the sword to level up, reducing his stats in an attempt to minimize the damage he would cause by losing control. Then Fate falls to the ground, but at that moment, mine appears. She comments that she did not expect that day to come so soon and reminds him that she warned him that if he overloaded, his ability would lose control. Fate apologizes and tells her to end his life. The girl says she will keep her promise and prepares to strike his head. Fate prepares for his end, but just as Mine's about to hit him, Roxy appears and pulls him out of the way of the blow. She asks what Fate was trying to do, but he avoids her gaze because he doesn't want the knight to see him in that way. Roxy starts crying and says that no matter the power Fate has, he is still the same. At that moment, Fate realizes that the greed ability was calming down and returning to control. His eyes return to normal and Roxy extends her hand, telling them to return to Babylon. This makes him remember the other time she saved him. He takes her hand while thinking about how he was afraid Roxy would hate him after discovering the truth about greed, but even after learning everything, she still accepted him the same way. So Fate realizes that despite him constantly saying he wanted to save her, in reality, he wanted her to save him. Soon after, the boy faints in Roxy's lap. Mime realizes her friend is now under control and leaves as Fate had found his support. Some time later, he wakes up and realizes he's in the inn's room. Additionally, his arm wound is bandaged. Fate looks out the window, noticing it's already evening, wondering how long he slept. At that moment, Eris appears and explains he slept for an entire week. The girl along with mine returns greed to him. Fate notices the sword is quite dirty and Eris explains they had to go to the center of Gilead to retrieve the weapon, deducing that a monster must have taken it there. Greed comments that he thought he'd never return and Fate complains to Mime for forgetting his sword. She reveals she was busy dealing with Envy, the Black Sword Gun, one of the weapons of the capital Sin, explaining she was controlling Norvin like a puppet. Fate asks if Greed was aware of that, but the sword explains it had no idea Envy could use mind control but says it's not surprised. Eris then comments that they couldn't ignore such a danger because it would be a big problem if Envy found a vessel like Northern. Fate asks if they destroyed the sword, but Mine explains that the weapons of the capital Sin cannot be destroyed and tells him she threw Envy with force to the other side of Gilea, leaving Fate disappointed with the most stupid solution possible. Next, Eris changes the subject, stating that he proved his potential after defeating the Divine Dragon, and they needed his help. She explains that the plan to create a crowned human with Roxy's loss failed, but before Eris continues, Fate asks her to swear never to go after Roxy again making it clear he'll only listen after she promises. Eris promises and admits that the plan was actually Envy's idea, confessing she was foolish to agree with it. However, she explains that with the departure of the Divine Dragon, the country will enter a new era, and they need his help for what comes next, something only those with abilities of the capital Sin should handle. Fate doesn't understand what the two of them want from him, but he agrees to help since he was born with the ability of gluttony. Thinking there must be a reason for it, he would like to know what it is. Eris explains that first they have to regenerate his arm, which surprises Fate because he had never heard of magic that could do such a thing. Later, the girl tells them to leave before Roxy returns because it's currently dangerous for him to be near the Holy Knight, noting that gluttony only stirred at the mention of her. Fate realizes Eris is right and agrees to leave without saying goodbye to Roxy. Later, Mugen and Emiria train together, the girl distracting him to win when Roxy appears. She immediately leaves the fight to follow the Holy Knight. Roxy explains she's leaving and asks Miria to take care of things while she's away. The girl promises to handle everything, but is irritated because she knew Roxy was going to see fate again. Meanwhile, Roxy goes through a market and decides to bring grapes to the boy. However, when she arrives in the room, she doesn't find anyone and becomes worried that he has disappeared. Later, Roxy finds a letter. In it, fate apologizes for leaving without saying goodbye and for never telling her about his gluttony ability. 
He also explains that although he has to leave, he will come back and ask her to take care until then. Roxy finishes reading the letter and thinks about how brave fate is for fighting alone. In a flashback, it is shown how they met. Roxy was walking through the capital when she encountered the boy. She approaches him to warn that it's dangerous to walk around at that time and asks him to go home. However, fate is terrified, thinking he will be beaten for angering a holy knight. Roxy explains that it was just a warning, but the boy continues to show fear of her. She apologizes for scaring him and explains that she is ashamed of being a holy knight, feared by all. At that moment, Fate's stomach growls and Roxy buys him some sandwich pieces, making the boy very happy. Afterward, she asks him to go home, saying his family must be worried. However, Fate explains that he has no home or family, but still leaves happily after eating. Roxy is worried and asks if he has a place to stay, but Fate replies that he doesn't, although now he knows the capital is not as bad as he thought, saying he liked meeting such a cool holy knight. Roxy remembers that day and thinks it was after that she managed to keep her head up and be proud to be a holy knight. Then she decides to become even stronger for when the time comes to meet fate again. Meanwhile, the Vleric brothers discover that the corpse was fate. Memel is surprised by a discovery, but Raphael doesn't comment on it and just says he will return to his research, leaving his sister curious about what he was researching. Alone, Raphael comments that he is happy fate killed his brother Hado and starts laughing like a maniac while looking at the Philosopher's Stone. At the same time, Fate gives 40% of his stats to Greed so the Sword can use its secret technique, the Twilight Healing from its fourth level. In a matter of seconds, his arm regenerates, leaving him as good as new and ready to continue his journey. However, Eris bids farewell, explaining they will meet again in the capital. Mayan also goes her own way, leaving Fate once again alone with Greed, who continues with its demands. She says that now that he is a warrior who has reached the E rank, they need something more appropriate and sophisticated than the sheath like carbuncle whetstones. And so fate returns to fighting various monsters to earn enough money to buy the equipment greed desires. Hey folks, that was the grand finale of this first season of the N9. I hope you all enjoyed it. Drop a like down below and subscribe to the channel so we can bring you more N9 seasons. Catch you in the next video.